we're actually the second educators in your children's life because you are the first teachers. And we want to work in partnership with all of you because we can't do this work alone. All right, welcome to the January 18th, 2024 uh, FCSD regular Board of Education meeting. Superintendent, will you call roll? Yes, Mr. Clark. Here. Ms. Larratt. Here. Ms. Lofthouse. Please note for the record she's absent. Mr. Reed. Here. Mr. Huey. Here. Thank you. All right, in a moment, we'll be heading to closed sessions where we will be discussing uh, the following matters, uh, student matters, um, employee, employee, employer, employee relations, conference with legal counsel, conference with real property negotiators and personnel matters. Uh, I do not see any public comments for any closed session items in person. Are there any online? I appear that that's a no. Uh, so we will recess into closed session and be back at six o'clock. All right, welcome back to open session. For those just entering the room, welcome to the January 18th, 2024 regular Board of Education meeting. If you all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. That brings us to uh, item 4C, broadcast statement. A broadcast and recording is being made at the direction of the board, and the broadcast may capture images and sounds of those attending the meeting. Folsom Cordova Unified School District Board Policy 1313 promotes mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among employees, parents, and the public. We will treat staff, parents, and members of the public with respect and expect the same in return. If any member of the public uses obscenities or communicates in a demanding, loud, insulting, or demeaning manner, the board will calmly and politely admonish the person to communicate civilly. Public comments during board meetings are an important component of public engagement and transparency. Members of the public will not be permitted to yield their speaking time to another member of the public. All written comments submitted by 3 p.m. today to the board have been read. Per the Brown Act, the board is not allowed to enter into a two-way discussion on any matter not on the agenda. Superintendent, will you take the roll? Yes, Mr. Melajor? Here. Mr. Merrill? Here. Mr. Clark? Here. Ms. Larratt? Here. Ms. Lofthouse? Please note for the record she's absent tonight. Mr. Reed? Here. Mr. Huey? Here. Thank you. And that takes us to item five, reporting out closed session. Superintendent, is there anything to report from closed session? No action to report tonight out of closed session. And that takes us to item six, adoption of agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Move it. So a motion by Mr. Clark? I'll second. Second by Mr. Melajor. Superintendent? Mr. Melajor? Aye. Mr. Merrill? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Ms. Larratt? Aye. Ms. Lofthouse? Mr. Reed? Mr. Huey. Aye. Motion carries 4 0. And it moves on to item seven special presentations. Uh, we'll start with item A students. Uh, Superintendent. Well, we're very excited this evening to have our room full of many of our uh, students from the middle school and high school level and their coaches and their families. We want to um, congratulate all of our fall season of sport um, athletes and coaches and families for their commitment that it takes not only on competition day, but everything that leads up to that. So tonight we're gonna to be honoring the folks that are in the room. I'm gonna ask Mr. Peter Maroon, our Director of Athletics to come forward and do the introductions. Thank you and welcome. Good evening, uh, Direct, or, uh, Dr. Kaligian, President Huey, members of the board, colleagues, proud parents, and most importantly, our incredible high school and middle school athletes. Uh, we're gathered here to celebrate a group of exceptional teams and individuals who have not only demonstrated unparalleled dedication to the sports arena, but have also excelled in the classroom. 
These student athletes have truly embodied the spirit and balance, discipline, achievement, setting a remarkable example for their peers. In the competitive world of middle and high school sports, our athletes have not only showcased their physical prowess, but have also displayed outstanding sportsmanship and teamwork. They have consistently demonstrated the values of fair play, resiliency, and respect. Through victories and challenges alike, they have grown into leaders and ambassadors of our schools. Today is just a, uh, about, it's not just about celebrating our student athletes and their achievements. It's also about applauding their student athletes who have embraced and demands of the task of balancing academics with their commitment to sports. The classroom is proving ground for education, focus, and hard work manifested in academic success. Our athletes have not only risen to that challenge, but have excelled, showcasing a determination to be champion in both realms. Their achievements in the classrooms are a testament to their ability to manage time effectively, prioritize responsibility, and maintain a strong work ethic. These skills will undoubtedly serve them well as they venture beyond high school into the wider world. Let's not forget about the importance of the teamwork and the leadership on the academic front. These student athletes have not only excelled individually, but have also contributed to a positive collaborative learning environment. They have inspired their peers, motivated to strive for, greater, for greatness, both academically and athletically. As we applaud their achievements, let's also uh, not, not forget to express our gratitude to their coaches, teachers, and parents who have, paid, who have played a pivotal role in nurturing and guiding these student athletes. It is through their unwavering support and mentorship that our student athletes have thrived and grown into the remarkable individuals we honor today. I have to share with you a, a personal um, uh, opportunity for me to gain a perspective on this. This year, we got the opportunity to have flag football for all of our schools, all three of our, our girls' flag football teams. That to me was awesome. I got a chance to take down the picture from upstairs from the 1923 first girls basketball team at Folsom High, and I shared that with some of the kids at the banquets. I thought it was awesome. I shared with them that uh, someday kids will look at this picture and say, this was the first flag football team at this school. We're gonna start off with Folsom Middle School, and if I got Coach Patrick Burke, are you here, Coach? Come on up. The girls' varsity soccer team. The girls' varsity soccer team for uh, Folsom Middle School, um, which competes in a very tough league. It's the Foothill Athletic League, which encompasses basically both um, rescue and uh, Buckeye as well as FCUSD. So it's a tough league. It's not an easy place. With 3,500 kids playing the surf soccer in this community, includes Rancho Cordova, that's a lot of com competition these kids are a part of. So for this team to excel and win this year was phenomenal. So I want to congratulate on behalf of the school district and the board, Coach Burke and his girls for an excellent uh, year this year and winning the athletic league for uh, the Foothill Athletic League. Back to back. Oh, sorry, back to back. He corrected me. In addition, Folsom Middle School's eighth grade boys cross country team. Are you gentlemen here? You. Come on up. Come on up, guys. Is the coach here? Okay. Again, during the fall uh, for middle schools, there's only really three sports, and Folsom Middle uh, basically won two of the three sports. So congratulations to them. This, this eighth grade boys cross country team did win the uh, Foothill Athletic League led by, by their coach and their principal, Dr. Daniels. So congratulations to you guys as well. Can we do a board meet, board and picture with the, both teams? You guys thought you were done. They can come down to this one, I think. Okay, I guess yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cover this way. All right. All right. Come on up. Parents, I'm going to give you so much time to take I promise I'm just going to grab one for the district. 
Okay, everybody. Oh my goodness. I gotta get this. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. All right. Look over here real quickly, and then I'll get out of the way. Okay. Thank you, parents. Hold on. Around the audio, and I was like, and she, like, she said hi because I was like, is that her? Like, Next team I'd like to uh, honor is Vista DeLago High School football team, varsity football team. <laughs> Coach Landis, come on up with your staff and your players. You want the players up here with you? <laughs> so the Vista Del Lago High School football team matched a feat none, not since uh, 2012, a record of 10 and two, and a trip to the semifinals of the second time uh, for in three years, earning very top honors, the Cal um, League champs, this varsity team and senior class cemented a culture building on the history of those before them and setting a new standard. They earned uh, more than all league awards, more, any, more than any other school, all league awards um, in their league. This group was and forever will be special in the hearts of the Vista community. And gentlemen, we'll be calling some of you guys back up for the All League, and we'll do one big giant picture with all schools. So stick around. Please don't disappear on me. Next team. Coach Doherty here? Hey, Coach Doherty, if you can make your way up to the podium, please. Folsom High School football team for the 2023 continues to build on a dynasty that started in 2010, earning the school's fifth CIF state championship in 13 years. The only other program that has more state championships is De La Salle with six. This team has led, has been led by a senior group, a ton of skilled players that are young. With a record of 13 and two, the Bulldogs had to come from behind to beat St. Bonaventure in the last minute of the game. Congratulations to Coach Doherty and his staff and his players for being the Sierra Foothill League champs, the CIF Sac Joaquin Section Division I champs, the CIF NorCal Regional D1A champs, and the CIF State Division I-A champs. Congratulations, gentlemen. We're going to do the same thing, call you guys up in a few once we do all the all league. I just want to recognize the team. So thank you guys. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. We're going to start doing our individual awards for all league. And this is basically the way that all league works in every league. They get to vote on the kids who are the top performing athletes in each of the sports. With that, um, our schools have, you know, they're in three different leagues, and um, I've got about 78 kids here to be recognized. That just goes to show you how, um, how awesome it is for our athletes to compete in these leagues and be recognized. I'll start with Cordova High School, and I'd like to ask um, Assistant Principal Cody Owens to come up and join me, please. So we're going to recognize girls um, cross country and boys cross country, flag football, football, girls golf and volleyball in that order for each of the schools. And we'll start off with Cordova High. So if you want to go down the list. Coach Gruber, you can come up and help us out. He's somewhere in this crowd. Um, he'll be accepting the awards for uh, anyone who's not present. He's stuck right there. I can see him. He's trying to make his way through. All right. First one we're going to call up is Stephanie Santana. Oh. 
Next, Marissa Santos Vargas. Uh, Juliet Cuthino. <clears throat> Amelia Nunn. <clears throat> Daniel Insko. <clears throat> Justice Ramirez. Ezekiel Kone. <clears throat> All right, our flag football coach couldn't be here, uh, Garrett Roth, so um, I'll accept the awards if no one's here. All right, uh, first up, Justice Johnson Patterson. Uh, Mia Worley. Uh, she got hurt after the season, I think. Uh, Jenny Seja. And then uh, Talia Johnson. Talia. Talia Johnson. <laughs> All right, uh, football. Can we get uh, Krista Mayfield up here? She's our uh, like team manager. All right, first is Jaden Rice. <clears throat> Julian Dran. <clears throat> Anthony Gomez. Damaje Moses. <clears throat> Nasaya Paul Alston. Jabari Davis. <clears throat> All right, our uh, golf coach couldn't be here, but next up is uh, Christiana Lorette for girls golf. <clears throat> All right, uh, for volleyball, Joseph Smith. That's our coach, sorry. All right, uh, this... Student couldn't be here, I don't think, but Olivia Espinoza. And then Naya Brown. Thank you. Why don't we take Cordova High here and then let's go ahead and bring them? Don't know After if they'll be able to fit. Yeah. We don't want the board in the front or the back. You know what, board, you guys, there's a lot of, how about if the board stands up behind the dais and then we ask the students to just kind of pick the back up and Hold on. We got some tall ones. Okay, so. Can it work? We need, we need a couple of you guys to come in this way, squish in. So coaches, you're not in the frame. Just move in a little bit. And on this side too, oops. 
We do. We need music to play in these interims. <laughs> okay. All right. If everybody could look here and one, two, three. All right. Great. Thank you so much. And don't go anywhere because I bet you have family and friends that want to get a picture. So parents. All right, so give them a round of applause, Cordova High School, and they're all athletes. I'm going to ask Principal Cadenhead to join me from Folsom High School to recognize all his student athletes. All right. I'm just right here. You got to flip over to the other side when you're done. Okay. Am I calling out coaches? Yeah, they're here. Cross country first. Steve here. Uh, is Coach Kinoshita here? Oh, come, come on up, Tracy. Okay, we're going to start with uh, all league for cross cross country boys, Jeffrey Deacon. We have sick kids, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go fairly quickly. Owen Wisely, sick as well. Okay, not here. And who's here for flag? Bobby's here. Oh, Bobby's here. Is Coach Trujillo here? Play football? Bobby? There you are. All right. Uh, for flag football, uh, all league, Kira Lacombe. Good job. All right. And then uh, Coach Doherty. Still here? Yes? There he is. Okay. Football, all league, Ryder Lions. Um, also, Theo Greiley. And R.J. Witten. Jameson Powell. Luke Sorensen. Brian Ray. Kenny Redhead. I don't know if Kenny's here. I think I saw Damien. Damien Rivera. Yeah, there he is. Elijah Gulowich. Lucas Hardiman. And Jaron Hodson. Diego Villarreal. Oh, Diego. All right. And Richard Semenza. Okay. And girls golf. For any of our golf there, Paul, come on up. All right, and let me see where I am. Amelia, is it Kambanjong? Yeah. Um, tennis, girls tennis. You guys come on up, Kelly. There we go. All right, so girls tell us tennis, Jayani Dugarala. Emily Yang. <laughs> Girls volleyball. Devin's here. Devin, there he is. Come on up. First girls volleyball player, Addie. Uh, ooh. 
What is it? Can a geezer. Sorry, Addy. Kelly Wong. And Chloe Wong. And that is it. Board, you guys want to stand up behind them? And we'll get them kind of squeezed in. Right with you guys. Oh, yeah, no, you're gonna have lots of time to take pictures for sure. Okay, y'all walk, look up here. One, two, three. Thank you so much. Don't go anywhere. Your parents want pictures. <laughs> One more. No? Nope. Nope. You good? Thank you, Folsom Hive. We have the uh, cross country coach from Vista del Lago. Daniel here. Oh. So, for cross country from Vista del Lago, I have Teddy Beavers. <laughs> coach Landis, can I help you uh, up here to help me out? Give me a second. Thank you. <laughs> also from cross country is Xavier Bitwa. Ian Inquest. Josh Huey. <laughs> Going except on his behalf. <laughs> Max Rice. Laura Lucia. Addison Long. <laughs> Brianna Menyon. <laughs> Matlin O'Brien. And Elizabeth Fadoop. <laughs> Obviously, Vista has a long group of runners, and cross country is one of their favorite sports. Uh, moving into girls' uh, flag football, I see Coach Isabel is here. Come on up, Coach. So I have Amanda Nasworth. Is she here? Congratulations. Thank you. And Macy Spato. Is she here? Okay. Yeah, hey, uh, where did the cross country group? Nobody was here from them, right? But Coach Lines, don't go away. Come on back. <laughs> Sorry. We're going to move right into a football. So, Coach, you want to call them up and I'll hand out to them? Let's go right there. Your coaches, your athletes right there. Perfect. All right, Vista Football League. Nick Braver. Yeah. Xavier Bryan. Yeah. League defensive MVP, Cam King. Can be your night. We'll go ahead and get Kelly Butcher up here to accept for the guys who couldn't make it. League Offensive MVP, Johnny Kett. Two-time Cal MVP, Matt Long. Logan Murray. Nick Navarre. Lyman of the Year, Brandon Nasworth. Andrew Powers. 
Matthew Wurpee. And because Peter told me I had to announce it and it's going to annoy him, we're going to go ahead and bring Chris Werpe up here as a member of, oh, sorry, Max Voda. And the last member of our staff who was able to make it tonight for the staff of the year, Chris Werpe. Coach Landis is a little bit humble. He was recognized as the coach of the year, but he accepted it as the coaching staff of the year. Girls golf. I have anybody from girls golf from Vista. Okay. Sabina Hahn. And Julian McNamara. Girls tennis. You're awesome. Those tennis is right there, starting off with, yeah. So we were also undefeated uh, two years in a row. Just want to throw that out. <laughs> and we do, our number one player um, had a golden match, which means she never lost a point. So she won the match 6-0, 6-0, but did not even lose a point. And she's here tonight, so I'll make sure to point her out. Um, so first up, we've got Jovia Lowe. Ask you to explain what that meant. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard of it before. <laughs> Next, we have Kaylee Wynn. Here's the golden match Clarissa Sutami. Sutami. And then our number one doubles player, Alicia Suda. All right, girls volleyball. Is coach uh, here? Okay. Alex Anderson. Peyton Huber. Addie Smith. And Lily Smith. That is Vista Lago High School. Can we get you guys to kind of pull in the middle and we'll have the board stand behind you and get the picture? Want to get your picture. Thank you, Vista Delago. One last piece of trivial pursuit for you. This is the first year in my eight years in this position that we didn't have a single high school student on academic probation. Ooh. All right, Mr. Maroon, thank you so much. Uh, students, thank you for being here. We are incredibly proud. We know how much work went into this. So uh, thanks for being with us. I'm going to give it just a minute or two. OK, that brings us to uh, item B, staff presentation. I believe we have no presentation from staff, Superintendent? That's correct. Great. And then that brings us to item eight, public comments. Time will be given to speakers at the discretion of the board chairperson. 
The law allows the public to address the board on any matter not on the agenda, but the law prohibits action by the board on non-agenda items. I did want to mention we have several speakers who would like to speak about Indigenous Peoples Day uh, because we will be talking about Vista del Lago concerns under discussion items. Uh, we'll save those items until discussion. So if, if you are here to speak on that tonight, um, just ask you to sit tight until that item comes up where that uh, will be the appropriate place. Um, so with that being said, uh, I'd like to invite up our first speakers, um, Anna McHenry uh, and Debbie Burns. And it looks like maybe Christine Kleinley will be also joining you all. Welcome. Hey, thank you. Hi. Hello. Good evening, uh, Dr. Kleegan, Board of Trustees, District Staff, um, and Folsom and Cordova Communities. We are VISTA counselors. I am Debbie Burns. This is Anna McHenry, Christine Kleinley, and we are three of the four FTE at VISTA. Um, Julie Werner, who you all know, works also at the district office, and Stacey Pillion is um, the other two that share a position at VISTA. Um, first, we would like to congratulate Dr. Kleegan on your retirement. Congratulations. Uh, we hope that you have a wonderful journey ahead of you, um, whatever you may be doing, and we thank you for your service and time to our communities. Okay. Um, we would like to thank the district and school board for recognizing the need for additional counseling and for increasing counselor FTE throughout the district. Um, although there are a lot of positions within our schools still um, not filled, we um, thank you because this increase allows us to better serve our students. So thank you. We hope that that gets to continue because it's not yet in our <laughs> contract. Um, Vista Del Lago counselors, uh, term two started in January. We are, our students um, are on a four by four schedule. So they start a whole new four classes. At the beginning of each term, students are given the opportunity to request a change in their schedule. Approximately 500 students um, requested uh, changes. Those submissions were um, spent by us for the first two weeks of school, ensuring that students were in classes and that teachers were within their contract. Hi. Um, currently, we're working with our 450 seniors to submit required documents and transcripts to complete their college applications. It's, just, it's not just about the paperwork. We recognize that this season brings with it a roller coaster of emotions for our students, the highs of acceptance and the lows of possible rejections. In these moments, our support goes beyond the academic. We stand by our students, offering a helping hand and listening ear, understanding that this journey is not just about grades, but about personal growth. We are gearing up for the registration starting the Jan on January 29th for the 2024-25 school year. We'll be meeting with students one-on-one -on -one to guide them with their goals and course selections. We will welcome our incoming freshmen at the ninth grade information night on February 27th. In March, we look forward to meeting with our local middle school students individually to assist them in their transition to Vista Del Lago High School. And although as counselors, there are certain tasks that are done throughout the year, like the ones mentioned above, our days are also full working with students, supporting their emotional needs, including anxiety, struggles with attending class, pressures of academic success, social interactions, and family struggles. Many times students also need guidance with internships, college resources, and job opportunities. Overall, we are the hub for student need, and we enjoy the daily interactions that come with supporting our students. We invite all of you to come visit our counseling department and learn more about our program. Thank you for your continued support and dedication to all of our students in Folsom Cordova Unified School District. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, the next feature speaker is Joshua Mize. He'll be followed by Jennifer Raguto. Welcome. Thank you, uh, board members, for giving us your time, which is the greatest gift that one can give. First, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Miwok, Maidu, and Isnan people, which are still living here and alive and flourishing in and around the Sacramento area. 
While their villages no longer exist here, I think about them often when I go on river walks. Uh, we all have the power to change lives, the course of history today and moving forward towards the future. Today, I advocate for Indian education and Folsom Cordova Unified School District. My name is Joshua Mize. I am co-chair of the Native American Parent Advisory Committee, or NAPAC, of Folsom Cordova Unified School District. I'm a descendant of the Quapaw, Osage, Menominee, and an enrolled member of the Ho-Chunk Nation. I have four children in this district. One is in preschool, one in kindergarten, and two in high school. I grew up in Ranch Cordova, as these kids are. Uh, we bought a house in 1994. At that time, it was just my father and me. And all that time, I never knew of a, a native program within the district. I always, I always knew programs existed in other places in Sacramento, but they seemed so far away. It felt like I was the only native kid growing up in Ranch Cordova. In that regard, I felt no connection with the schools here. I did the best I could going through Mitchell Junior High, but my suspension rates were high. When I got to Cordova High, I remember being in overcrowded rooms and being over overwhelmed. I remember getting suspended and not doing well in school. I was sent to Kenny High School, but fell through the cracks of the education system and ended up dropping out at 18. 10 years later though, I acquired my GED and with the support of a native community, I went on to college graduating from UC Davis with a GPA of 3.42. I would have benefited from an organization, Title VI program in this district with promotion ceremonies that offer more traditional native practice teachings, histories, and guidance. Stories like mine are all too common. Some turn out very badly. I believe though that they can be avoided but can be turned towards success earlier than later. As this area grows, evolves, expands, we at Native people and the school district should grow together in greatness, understanding, compassion, and commitment to student success. Today, I advocate for those students as myself. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Rodrigo, followed by Albert Titman Sr. Welcome. So I thought I was gonna go last, so I don't have some big speech. I just wanted to say hello. And my name is Jennifer Rodrigo, and I am an employee of Folsom Cordova Unified School District. I am also, first and foremost, a federally recognized citizen of the Ion Band of Miwok Indians. Almost five years ago, I had my own student attend Cordova High School and wished that we had a Native American Indian education program in the district to attend. We would drive to Sac City Unified to continue, to continue cultural classes, mentorship, tutoring, and other programs. And while I no longer have my own children in the school system, I am here this evening to provide support to our families to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Albert Titman Sr. is next, followed by Nikki Cram. Welcome. Majuk Sasa. Kanyasas Albert Titman, a Tumale Nisanan Miwuk Maidu, the Desi Band of the Fruit River people. I just want to say thank you to the board for allowing us to come up and share a little piece of our heart and our experience. My name is Albert Titman. My tribal heritage is Nisanan. Miwok and Maidu, uh, my ancestors lived here since the beginning of time. We believe our creation started here in any direction along the river systems, the lakes, the streams. And uh, I'm the deputy director for an organization called the Native Dads Network. And our role is to advocate for fathers and their families, which means mothers, fathers, children, uh, to meet the needs of whatever they may be facing in their lives. And today I'm here to advocate for the NAPAC, the Native American Parent Advisory Committee, in helping to develop a Native American Indian education program in the Folsom Cordova Unified School District. In my role, we've uh, assisted other school districts, Yolo County, Woodland Unified, Washington Unified, in helping them develop and implement an Indian education program there, Title VI funded program, which is a federally funded program, been in existence for decades. 
Uh, we've also helped uh, the Twin Rivers Unified School District in developing uh, an Indian education program. All this within the past two years. So in the history of Sacramento County, Yolo County, across the United States uh, for decades, that we don't have an Indian education program here in Folsom Unified School District is really a disservice to the families, uh, especially to our children. And so our goal is not to shame or blame. Our goal is to heal, provide healing. And my role is to be a strong advocate and a voice for the ones that have historically um, been oppressed. And in, in the state of California, we try not to use the word genocide, overly use the word genocide, but that's exactly what has happened here. And with all the beauty that's happening in, in the Folsom Unified School District, and I read the vision and the mission statement, and it adds culture in there. But I implore you to add Indian education and the cultural teachings that come along with the Title VI funded program. And I'm going to read a little bit. The purpose of the Title VI Indian Education Grant is to fulfill the federal government's unique and continuing trust relationship with and responsibility to American Indian and Alaska Natives for the educational needs of American Indian children. The federal government, in its relationships with sovereign nations, will continue to work with local educational agencies toward the goal of ensuring programs that serve American Indian children and are of the highest quality and provide not only the basic elementary and secondary educational needs, but the unique education and culturally related services to our children. So I implore you, I implore you, when, and I'll just be honest, we're going to continue to push until, because it is a federal right for us to have Indian education in the public school system. So thank you for my time. Thank you. Next speaker is Nikki Grant, followed by Emma Smiling. <clears throat> Good evening, Folsom Cordova board members. My name is Nikki Grant, and I am Oglala Lakota from Pine Ridge, um, South Dakota. But I grew up in Rancho Cordova, California. I've been a part of the school district since pre-K to high school. This firsthand experience has allowed me to witness the barriers faced by Native American students. <clears throat> Today, I advocate for the establishment of a Title VI Indian, ed pro ed Indian education program, a vital necessity for academic success and cultural well-being of our Native American students. As a mother of five, three enrolled in the school district, and one coming up, I've seen the educational system often overlook the unique needs of our Native students. A Title VI Indian education program is a commitment to addressing these disparities. Fundamentally, such a program mu must acknowledge the diverse cultures and traditions of the Native American community. Our children need more than academic instruction. They need an environment fostering cultural pride and understanding. A, cultural, a Title VI program provides the resources to infuse our curriculum with the rich history and contributions of Native Americans. A few examples that I would like to point out are I have noticed that there is the existence of a school within the Folsom Unified School District named Sutter's Fort. Um, the name is damaging to Native people as it glorifies a historical figure associated with the oppression and displacement of Native communities. I urge the district to consider the impact of such names of, on the well being of Native American students. Changing the name will, would be a meaningful step towards creating a more inclusive and respectful education environment. We must address academic challenges that negatively affect Native American students. Implant implementing targeted support like tutoring and mentorship ensures our children have every opportunity to excel academically. It's not about special treatment. It's about recognizing and resolving systemic barriers. Studies often show or have shown that when students see themselves reflected in their education, their academic performance improves and they develop a stronger sense of identity and belonging. I urge you to consider the lasting impact of implementing a Title VI education program. It's about creating an inclusive and equitable educational environment for all. As a parent and chair of the Native American Parent Advisory Committee, commi committee I want every Native American child in the district to be proud of their heritage, feel supported in their academic journey, and have the same opportunities of their, as their peers. Currently, right now, we have 19 506 forms and counting that are collected. Um, 
So there are there is a representation within the district and the need. So thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next speaker is Emma Smiley, followed by Pauline Ghost Perez. Mr. President, uh, before she starts, we'd like to give her an additional minute. Welcome. Good evening. My my name is Emma Smiley. I'm a proud member of a member of the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska, and I'm Sinchaga Lakota. As a Native American student in the Folsom Cordova Unified School District and student liaison for Native for the Native American Parent Advisory Committee, the importance of having an Indian education program is deeply personal. Such a pro program would provide a platform to amplify our voices, share our cultural heritage, and bridge the gap between academic learning and our unique backgrounds. Having an Indian education program is more than just the curriculum. It is an acknowledgement of our identity. It creates an environment where traditions, history, and contributions are not only recognized, but celebrated. This kind of recognition is crucial for fostering a sense of pride and belonging among Native American students. Additionally, an Additionally, an Indian education program would offer support tailored to our needs, ensuring that the educational system is sensitive to the challenges we may face, becomes a pathway to academic success while embracing and preserving our cultural roots. In essence, having an Indian education program is an investment in our futures, empowering Native American students to navigate their educational journey with confidence, pride, and a strong connection to their heritage. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Clark, thank you for the reminder on the time. Uh, next speaker is Pauline Ghost Press, followed by Christy Perez. Hello everyone, good evening members of the Folsom Unified School District. My name is Pauline Ghost, a proud member of both the Oglala Lakota tribe and the El Dorado Miwok tribe. As a parent with a child currently enrolled in the district and having started my educational journey in the first grade with the Folsom Cordova Unified, my engagement with the educational environment is personal. Having navigated the educational path within the district, I witnessed the unique challenges faced by our Native American students. Today, I advocate for the establishment of a Title VI Indian education program, an essential pillar for the academic success and cultural strengths of our Native American youth. A Title VI Indian education program is not just a suggestion, it's a dedication commitment to readdressing the educational disparities. At its core, such a program would must not only recognize but celebrate the rich diversity of cultures and traditions within the Native American communities. Our children deserve an educational environment that goes beyond textbooks, fostering cultural pride and understanding. A Title VI program is the conduit for infusing our curriculum with the vibrant history and contributions of Native Americans. I also bring to your attention a matter that weighs heavily on my heart, the existence of a school within the district named Zetters Fort. This term glorifying a historical figure linked to the oppression and displacement of Native American communities is unsettling. I urge the district to reflect on the profound impact such names can have on the well-being of Native American students. Consideration of a name change is an important step towards cultivating an inclusive and respectful environment, educational environment. Addressing the academic hurdles that extremely affect Native American students is imperative. Implementing targeted support mechanisms such as tutoring and mentorship programs ensures our children have equal opportunities to thrive academically. It is not seeking for favored treatment. It is about acknowledging and rectifying systematic barriers that hinder their success. Research consistently underscores the positive impacts of students seeing themselves reflected in their education. 
academic performance flourishes and profound sense of identity and belonging emerges. In conclusion, I urge you to consider the enduring impact of a well-instructed Title VI Indian education program. This is about foraging an inclusive and equitable educational environment for all. As a parent and advocate for the Native American Parent Advisory Committee, I des desire nothing more than for every child in the district, including my own, to embrace their heritage, feel empowered in their academic journey, and be offered the same opportunities as their peers. Thank you sincerely for your time and your thoughtful consideration. Thank you. <clears throat> Next speaker is Christy Perez, followed by Dana Seitz. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Christy. I'm a proud member of the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska and Sinchago, Lakota. As a Native American parent within the Folsom Cordova Unified School District and a member of the Native American Parent Advisory Committee, I feel having an Indian Education Title VI program <clears throat> is about more than just acknowledging our children's identity. It creates an environment where our traditions, history, and contributions are not only recognized but celebrated. This kind of recognition is crucial for fostering a sense of pride and belonging among the Native American students. I believe this program can be a transformative pathway to academic success for our children while embracing and preserving our cultural roots by providing important resources such as tutoring supported by the Title VI funding. As members of the Native American Parent Advisory Committee, we urge you to consider the implementation of a Native American education program in the Folsom Cordova Unified School District. Let us stand united in our commitment to providing an education that empowers every student, irrespective of their cultural background and ensures that our district thrives as a beacon of inclusivity, diversity, and educational excellence. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The speaker is Dana Sai is followed by Amy McBride. Welcome, Dana. Hello, my name is Dana Sayez. Sayez, nice thank you. Uh, I'm a mother of six and I'm a member of the Native American Parent Advisory Committee. My family is enrolled from the Hoopa Valley Tribe. Um, and my personal connection with this district dates back to when I was in first grade. So I've been around this district for about 23 years now. Um, to, today I'm here to advocate for the establishment of a Title VI Indian Education Program, a critical initiative for the academic success and cultural enrichment of our Native American students, including my six children that are currently in this district. With that, I understand the unique challenges faced by our Native students and the call for the Title VI Indian Education Program is a resolution to addressing educational disparities and ensuring a brighter future for all children, our children. I can advocate that I've seen a lot, a lot of students go down the wrong path just because they have not had the proper cultural introduction or anything else that has to do with that. Um, and I also wanna talk about something else concerning the school district, which is Sutter Middle School. We all know that Sutter Middle School needs a change. This school has been told that for many years now, and it's time that we make the change. Um, and as a committed parent engaged with the NAPEG and someone who cares deeply about all the students, including American Native American students, my sincere wish is for success for every single student in this district. And we aren't gonna get that success until we find change. And the change is today and the change is now. So thank you for your time and thank you for everything else. Thank you. <laughs> the next speaker is Amy McBride followed by Gail Bruce. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Amy McBride. I'm from Folsom Ranch, and thank you for having me again. Um, I wanted to start by just addressing something that happened in our meeting last week. There was a lot of talk about Cordova, and as a proud Cordova graduate and living in Rancho Cordova for 20 years, I just wanted to talk about how much I loved going to Cordova High and how beautiful the campus it is. Thank you, Jen, for what you just did there. It was awesome in the weight room. Um, and I just wanted to point out that, like, I love it. You saw Coach Gruber and I went to high school together who's there. He's back there. Um, probably Van and I had some of the same teachers because Kaplan, Cooper, Krieger, Ortez, Ham, Moore, McCann, Linares, Lobestall, I can keep going, are all still there from when I was in school. So I just wanted, I thought it was important to publicly have some positive things said about the high school for the students and the teachers that are still there. Um, 
After that, I'm just going to talk quickly about the construction and design costs of the new high school, just really fast. Um, all of us who are in SFID3 can look at our property tax bill and find the line item IMP3. And right now, the average home in that area um, from Sean was between the two areas was 800000 and that's paying right now 1650 per year just for those measure M fees. And that's been fluctuating, right, as more people moved in. When I first moved in, it was 3100 just for the, those fees. So I was really happy last week when we were talking about the taxes because I think it's really important. But I implore you not to delay things and to come up with um, other strategies. We have $59 million in developer impact fees that we can still use. Um, we can make smaller bond issuance in intervals. We can work with cities to get businesses involved to contribute and... Um, we don't have to buy new plans. All those plans from different districts, we can, those are public. So we can ask for them and we can use those and adapt them to help save money. And all of these things can help us make progress on the project while also minimizing the tax burden on our communities. Um, I'd also like to just point out with a little bit of Googling, I was looking at schools. They just built a double elementary school in Tracy for $80 million or are working on it. There is a K-8 school in Irvine that's going to serve a thousand students that broke ground in 2021, and that was 58 million. There's a TK-5 elementary school that's going to be in San Francisco that's for 95 million, and there's even a brand new high school in Compton that's going to go like state of the art everything for 1,800 students for 200 million. So I think we need to figure out ways to get our design costs down for our things, because I think that will help us a lot as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> our next speaker is Gail Boos, followed by Elena Wagner. Welcome. Good evening, board members. My name is Gail Boos, and I am a parent of two sixth and seventh graders currently attending Sutter Middle School. I'm speaking to you today on behalf of a group we haven't really heard from in the discussions about a new high school and that's the parents of current and near future Folsom High students. Of the three high schools in the district, each population has a unique perspective. Cordova High families can speak to the challenges of having an older facility and getting it updated. Vista High families can speak to the issues that come from being with a, in a facility that can't grow and can't even educate all the students within its boundaries. And Folsom High families can speak about the difficulties of being overcrowded and what that means to the students, their education, and their post-high school opportunities. I've brought other moms from North of 50 with me tonight that can attest to the fact that the overcrowding at Sutter and Folsom High is already impacting students at both schools. The idea that we would wait until 2028 or 2029 to relieve the strain on Folsom High seems unbelievable to me. We know that the students that need a high school are here in Folsom. These kids have been attending current Folsom schools for years. Local elementary schools were over at or over capacity until Mangini Ranch was built. Sutter Middle and Folsom High have been and will continue to educate this ever-growing population of students while being overcrowded. We need a plan that prioritizes a high school where the students are and get it built as quickly as possible. Despite what we've heard in previous meetings, a high school built in Folsom has never been done by the district. The city of Folsom put forth and got approval for bonds that built both Folsom High and Vista Del Lago. It's time for the district to build a high school where well over two thirds of the students live. The growth rate in Folsom Ranch is orders of magnitude higher than that of Rio Del Oro. We have an urgent need to get a new high school in Folsom as soon as possible. The students deserve to be educated in schools that aren't just shoving them into portables when portables don't solve the problem of bathrooms, cafeteria space, parking, security, the opportunity to participate in clubs and sports, just to name a few. Teacher retention will also suffer if they're working in an overcrowded school with no space to do their jobs. All of these things negatively impact students during an already stressful time in their lives. The committee that has been created should include voices from Folsom High School, at least in the form of a student representative. They are and will be the most physically impacted by what will happen between now and when a new high school is completed. Even if an agreement can be made that gets a high school built in time for the 27-28 school year, immediate plans must be made to enhance the capacity at Folsom High and or Vista Del Lago, in addition to what's already been discussed about closing Folsom High to transfer from both inside and outside the district. The time to get creative is now. The time to select a location and begin the work of building is now. 
the classes of 25, 26, and 27 will not be able to avoid all of the impact of over, that overcrowding brings, but we have time to make a difference for the classes of 2028 20, and beyond by giving these kids what they need, getting a high school built, and making room on the committee for a whole fulsome high student and parent. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you. The next speaker is Elena Wagner, followed by Wendy Perez. Welcome. Good evening. Um, I do want to kind of touch back on what Amy was discussing when we're talking about costs, not just about, you know, the tax rates and how to keep those down. And there's a multitude of ways um, to do that, but also about continuously projection of building costs. Um, ultimately, I think we've all realized the plans for both Mather Morrison, which were well laid, and also for Folsom Ranch High School are just too expensive for the affordable week. I think we're all in agreement on that. Um, but that doesn't mean we have to go back to the drawing board. Um, the plans from other schools, from other districts are public domain. We can get them essentially at no cost just by doing a respectful request. Um, we can also uh, wrote, uh, restate what Sean Martin said last week, that the cost for phase one high school at uh, $469 million for 2029 dollars still was assuming the two-story non-campus style facility. That's not representative of what that will cost in 2029 dollars. I would venture to say it's you know, throw a number, $100 million less. And when we're talking about the cost of our schools that we know definitively for the L's, the middles, and the highs, $100 million is a lot of money. Um, I don't think that we can just stick with that projection that staff gave and not clarify that for everyone. Um, we can also look to other nearby schools, like Amy was mentioning. Um, in Hollister, California, they were building a 1,400 student high school in 2028 completion for 200 million. I also spoke to the superintendent of Banta, uh, Banta Unified School District today, which is, uh, if you know Tracy, you know just an hour and a half away from us. Um, they are building their phase one high school. Uh, ultimately planned for 2,500 students at 160 million in rough cost. Um, that school is going to be state of the art. Yes, they have developer assistance with uh, land acquisition costs, but we have that too with our development impact fees. It just comes from a different bucket of money. Um, I think that ultimately we all know what needs to happen. We all are working together as a community to research ways to keep these costs down, to make the money stretch further. We're all willing to make those sacrifices. Um, and I implore you guys and I implore the staff to really be creative in solving those, um, those issues for families so that we can keep tax rates affordable and uh, we can build the schools that we need without a lot of impact to the existing students and infrastructure of FCUSD. Thank you. <clears throat> Wendy Perez followed by Emma Lopez Friedrichs. Ladies and gentlemen of the board and members of the public, my name is Wendy Perez, and I'm both a teacher and also a parent at Carl Sendall Elementary School, where I teach third grade. I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of and strongly in support of our beloved Montessori program, taught by Ms. <laughs> Tara Marshall, who's here today back there. Um, all three of my daughters attended Carl Sendall, but only my youngest, Lila, had the privilege of spending three years in Miss Tara's Montessori class as a preschooler, a transitional kindergartner, and finally as a kindergartner. The year Lila started preschool, three other teachers on our staff besides myself made plans to put our own children into Miss Tara's class. We knew the benefits of a Montessori education uh, as well as the expertise and reputation of Miss Tara. <clears throat> My other daughters, my older daughters, had attended Montessori preschool and kindergarten elsewhere at private schools. Uh, so when Carl Sendall opened our Montessori program um, in time for my last child to attend and benefit, I was thrilled. In fact, I waited in line that year and arrived early to be sure I got my application in first so I wouldn't be waitlisted for this amazing program. Teachers did not get special attention as far as getting our kids into the program. Um, in Ms. Tara's class, Lila began as a tiny, timid three-year-old, carefully following after her older peers, loving every minute of her time doing jobs, uh, increasing her academic knowledge and skills, and learning the Montessori learning style. Little behavior instruction was needed as she had 16 older role models the transitional kindergartners and the kindergartners, showing her how to participate and learn in class. 
It was amazing to watch Lila and the other seven preschoolers learn and grow that first year. The following two years, Lila blossomed into a leader and a role model in the room herself as new younger students joined the class and she moved up in the ranks. During Lila's three years in Miss Ta uh, Tara's Montessori class, Lila learned self-confidence, leadership, <laughs> independence, how to be part of a community of learning, and most importantly, a joy and love of learning that is so emphasized in the Montessori program. Lila was always encouraged to challenge herself and grow in Miss Tara's class. Recently, I've been saddened to hear that there may be a possibility that our Montessori class would be replaced with a tra traditional transitional kindergarten class. I understand that this is a popular program and I also feel that it would be a tragedy to give up the beautiful, successful, and highly sought after Montessori program. In my opinion, instead of replacing our program, our program should be expanded. It's a wonderful, amazing program uh, that is well loved and very popular. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker is Emma Lopez Friedrichs, followed by Jacqueline Sells. I think you can stand on the chair. My name is Emma. I'm in kindergarten of Miss Tara's class. It's a place where you can learn more fast. That's where I got my smarts from, Miss Tara. That's where you got your smarts from? Not yeah. your mom? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Next one. I like how the materials have the learning skills to the little suitcase. It's really fun to learn with. My sisters are in that class. They're in TK. I'm there in preschool. I'm in kindergarten. Um, I like doing art at school. And I really like that my sisters are there. And I like that the program is really fun with the, with the materials. Really, I like, are really fun. Yeah. You say thank you? Thank you. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> Just some sh <laughs> real quick. Um, I meant to put my name down too. So I'm one of Emma's moms, and she is in the Montessori kindergarten program, started in TK. And I have two daughters who are in the preschool program. And I also have the joy of being a working mom. I work for a worldwide tech company. And one of the things that we strive on, I'm part of the DNI diversity and inclusion, RG, the employee resource groups. And our big push is hiring diverse talent and that just not it includes all different forms of walking on you know the path that you've taken but it's also diversity in the way you think and the way you problem solve and the way you work with people and that's exactly what the Montessori program does I've seen it with um, my own children and um, it's it's just really capital capitalizing on each child learns differently um, Emma has come and she read me a book last night and I'll have to admit we read to her every night and you know she practices but I was amazed at how far she had come with her reading skills with just her interaction with um, the Montessori program. They have materials that she talks about with the phonics object box and it's a way where you know it's a bunch of pictures and words spelled out that match the pictures and they get to sit this they get to select an object and then they sound out the word and they match that word and it's just a way for them to learn and read that's not maybe your traditional way which is great and in some kids you know they adopt it a little bit differently and that's exactly again what the Montessori program does is it it really taps into that diverse learning and captivates 
the kids to, you know, drive the interest that they have. And so I implore you as the board members to challenge us as the Montessori parents and staff to come to you with a solution and multiple solutions where everybody wins in this case. Um, I think we, I'm confident that if we can sit down and collaborate together, we can come up with something that works for everybody, where we do increase the traditional TK, but still be able to keep the authenticity of the uh, Montessori program. So thank you. Thank you. Right, next up is Jacqueline Sells, followed by Delna Ramirez. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Sells. I have one child in Montessori and one child that was in Montessori and is now in second grade. When I think about getting rid of the Montessori program, it makes it feels like a step backwards for the school district. Here we are teaching our kids that it's okay to be different, that we should accept and embrace these differences, but getting rid of this program feels like the opposite. Getting rid of the program is telling our children that everyone learns the same and forces children to learn that learn differently to suffer at no fault of their own. I specifically think of kids with impulse control issues or ADHD. Being allowed the choice to attend Montessori can be life-changing for these kids and their educational success. Montessori allows these children to learn at their own pace and their own styles rather than be forced to learn the same as the kids without these issues. I think how unfair it is that these kids are always in trouble for not being able to sit in their seat, being less or being more immature than their classmates or even just being who they are. We should be thinking about giving these kids an alternative way to learn. I feel that if we don't, we're gonna be putting pressure on the kids to have to learn the same as the other kids or put pressure on the parents to medicate our kids so that they conform to their classmates. So I just hope we can keep it open. I hope that we can expand it. I, I think this is a great program for all the kids, especially the kids that learn differently. That's it. Thank you. Next speaker is Delna Ramirez. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Delna Ramirez. And um, before I begin, I just wanted to show my appreciation for the Native Americans who are speaking tonight. Um, what they said resonated with my soul. And I want to thank them for their bravery for um, and their time for coming and talking about the Title VI program, which has my support. Um, also, the Montessori program, which I work with children um, in a different capacity. I work with children and horses and ponies. And the Montessori program is so good for so many of what I call um, superpower kids. And those are children who may have a different learning style. The reason why I came up tonight was because I wanted to thank any of you who have had anything to do with hiring Coach Groover, which is the cross country coach at Cordova High School. I have a junior who started at Cordova High School this year. And I have four adult children. The other three are adults and I mean, they're grown, they're out of their house, they're doing great. They've all played sports, never, in my 30 years of parenting, have I encountered a coach with more fervor, excellent communication skills, and true care for his athletes. My son came to Cordova wanting a different experience, which Cordova definitely gave him. He had a rough day, <laughs> his first day was um, challenging. There were things that he had not um, experienced before. Um, there was a couple of fights. Um, there was a fire alarm. He was discouraged at the end of the day. He said, Mom, I don't belong here at my former school. I don't belong there. Where do I belong? I think I just need to be homeschooled. I told him, son, I understand, I get it. 
why don't you go to that practice that the coach you met for cross country uh, talked about with you when you were filling out the paperwork, when we were filling out the enrollment paperwork. We had met Coach Groover as we were leaving and he said, hey, do you run? And um, my son said, yeah, I used to. And I said, oh, he's fast. So that's how we met him. After that first practice, my son wanted to come back and he has made the most wonderful friends. All of the parents love this coach and I just wanna express my gratitude for that. All of the students that were here being recognized tonight, really I see that as the dedication and the efforts that he's made for those students on the cross country team individually. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Before we go online, I, I did want to see if the board would um, consider, I know I had said earlier, we have several students who are here to speak about Indigenous, Indigenous Peoples Day. That is uh, going to be touched on discussion item C, Vista Del Lago student concerns. I think it's going to be more than an hour before we get to that point. Uh, I just want to see if the board would entertain allowing the students, if they would like to now, rather than later, uh, speak about this item. <laughs> Uh, so I, I will call your names. If, if you would rather wait until this is an item on the agenda, feel free to just say so. We'll save your card, but uh, otherwise you'd be invited to come up and speak, and we'll put four minutes on the clock. Uh, so the first speaker is Maya Poggenpohl. Oh, I apologize if I got your name wrong. And next up will be Gavin Martinez. Welcome. Hello. Uh, hi, my name is Maya Poggenpohl, and I'm a senior at Vista Del Lago High School. And I've come with my classmates today to speak about officially recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day in our school district. From the time I was a child, I have struggled to, tr to completely connect with my culture. I am half Filipino and half German American. Uh, and growing up, I wasn't exactly exposed to my cultures adequately. Naturally, this has to do with many factors, such as my parents wanting to embrace American culture more, or my relatives having been here so long that traditions are lost, or even me just not having grown up in an area where I know people whom I can share my cultural experiences with. But regardless of the reason, I too feel I too can feel how someone's culture might easily slip away, and I don't want that to happen to others in their cultures. By recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day in our school district, we can ensure that the history of Indigenous people isn't isn't forgotten. We live on Native land and Native people's history. Their struggles and culture and accomplishments should be told. Um, at Vista Lago, we have flyers in our classrooms recognizing that we are on Native soil. This is a good first step for, um, but as a district, we can we should be acknowledging that fact more directly. Um, by recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day on the second Monday of October, we can help keep cultural history alive. Over the past few months at Vista del Lago, we have promoted a petition to make Indigenous Peoples Day a reality. As of today, January eighteenth, uh, this petition has gotten one hundred twenty signatures from students and teachers. Um, at least 120 people at Vista Lago alone care about this issue, more than those of us who are here today at this board meeting. We're all eager for this change. I myself am eager for this change, a change that can ensure that cultures aren't lost, a change that acknowledges what has happened to the native people of this country, um, a, <laughs> a change that will ensure, that will educate current and future students of this district about an undertold history. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Maya. All right, next up, uh, if you would like to speak at this point, is Gavin Martinez, be followed by Meadow Castaneda. Welcome. Hi. Hello, my name is Gavin Martinez. I'm a senior at Vista Del Lago High School. I'm here today also in support of Indigenous Peoples Day. And before I begin, I would like to commend all the Native American parents who came here in support of Title X or Title VI. Yeah, okay, I'm fully in support of that as well, and our advocacy works in tandem. Um, now I'll start. When I look at my DNA results, it says I'm 8% Indigenous Mexican, 4% Indigenous to the Yucatan Peninsula, and 3% Indigenous Eastern South, South America. Those percentages are the entirety of what I know about my Indigenous heritage. Their cultures are generations removed from, the, from my life, and thus I can't relate to them, despite them collectively making up around 15% of my DNA, a common experience many other Hispanic Americans and those of indigenous descent. 
This is for a number of reasons. However, the protruding reason throughout has been the historical denial of the existence and value of indigenous people in society. This denial of indigenous people has assimilated their cultures and traditions to fit Western standards and belief systems. Furthermore, school systems have been a part of this effort. Boarding schools like the Carlisle Indian School work to strip indigenous children of their identity. However, even in public schools, when curriculum doesn't accurately describe the realities and multitude of struggles that Native Americans have endured, and instead prioritize a symbol of their oppression, in this case being Christopher Columbus, a man who, despite never actually touching North America and initiating decades of oppression throughout our country and many other countries, is revered and celebrated here. When and when this happens, Native culture becomes sidelined and it becomes easier to understand my and other people's personal disconnect from Indigenous culture. In 2021, the federal government released a proclamation commemorating Indigenous Peoples Day. FCUSD now has the opportunity to join a larger movement of people who are arguing for the basic idea that instead of celebrating a man who holds no true value in Sacramento County or Folsom Cordova, our school district can celebrate the people who do live here, that being people of indigenous descent, of those whose land we are on as right now. And it will be a first step in ensuring that people of indigenous descent are acknowledged and celebrated within our community. And for those like me who are far removed from indigeneity, celebrating the holiday will not will not erase the effects of history, but however, we will become more educated and more aware of the existence and cultures of Native American people. Thus, it is imperative for SUSD to officially proclaim the second Monday of October as Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And next up is Meadow Castaneda, followed by Samantha uh, Redding. Welcome, Meadow. Hello, my name is Meadow Castaneda. I've spoken at the last few board meetings, and today I'll continue speaking about implementing Indigenous Peoples Day on the second Monday of October throughout the entire FCUSD district. So at, at our previous meeting, it came to my attention that there were some kind of misconceptions about what we're advocating for. Uh, a response we received last month brought up Native American Heritage Month and Christopher Columbus Day, and specifically how, as a district, we recognize Indigenous people through Indigenous Heritage Day. However, as a student on Vista del Lago campus, uh, I haven't really seen any of that recognition translated onto any campuses in the district. Meanwhile, um, the state of California has issued a proclamation months ago declaring Indigenous Peoples Day on October 9th. This day is meant to honor Native Indigenous Americans in opposition to the celebration of Columbus Day. And while California stopped celebrating Columbus Day back in 2009, Indigenous Peoples Day remains an important event because Native Americans largely still unfortunately go unrecognized. It's less about the discontinuation of Columbus Day and more about the recognition of Indigenous people in this district. Indigenous Peoples Day is meant to recognize the painful history Indigenous people have faced and to celebrate their communities, a day of protest and resistance. This district will be raising the next generation of speakers, and it's important to understand how to grow alongside each student that passes through these schools. I'd appreciate that before making any decisions to keep an open mind and listen to the voices of every student and parents who showed up and took the time to speak today. We've been working for months to make a change here, and I believe this might be the only way that we can. I think that students are provided with a lot of additional support that many school districts don't have the opportunity to receive, and I'm grateful that I even have the choice, choice, chance for my voice to be heard here. But with that privilege, I feel it's necessary to use my voice to advocate for the people that have been spoken over for many years. So I'll continue attending board, meeting, board meetings because I care a lot about Indigenous Peoples Day and the school district as a whole. And the last thing I would like to see is for this thought to pass. And while I'm up here, I would like to mention that as someone who has mixed Indigenous heritage, and a student who has struggled with ADHD, um, monastery programs and Title VI are very helpful programs that I wish that I had growing up in this district. It has been a struggle to get through, but that hasn't stopped me from growing to love every single part of this district. And with that, I hope you guys consider this change and thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Samantha Redding, followed by Josie Bosart. Good evening. Thank you for your guys' time. Um, I definitely did not write as much as that, but um, I will try my best. My name is Samantha Redding, and I'm a senior at Vista Delago. 
I'm here today in support of getting Indigenous Peoples Day recognized within the district. While I'm ending my high school career here at Vista Lago High, throughout my education, I've been to three different schools in three different districts. In Sacramento, at River City High School, our 2000 students were from incredibly diverse backgrounds. Everyone's stories were different. We learned to appreciate and embrace each other's cultures and diversity, and we celebrated different cultures from around the world almost every other week. People put on elaborate dances and would share food and music and stories all important to their heritage. I specifically remember the celebration of the indigenous people vividly as it was filled with bright colors, lively music, and a traditional dance parading around the school. They welcomed everybody to share and partake in their activities and use it as a way to raise awareness and support for this normally underrepresented group. Changing schools and coming to the FCUSD district was a distinct experience. Vista itself was much different from my previous school, and I noticed that the representation of other people and their respective cultures was not as robust as it was at River City. Here, there aren't as many cultural events, and while some may know of Indigenous Peoples Day, very few actually know what it's for and about, and even fewer acknowledge it as its own day. This has to be changed as the land we live on is historically the land of Native people, groups like the Miwok, Maidu, and Nisanon, who are still fighting for federal recognition, and they're not the only ones. A total of 55 tribes in California alone still don't, still don't have federal recognition. While some may think it's pointless to try and help th change this, acknowledging Indigenous Peoples Day would create opportunities to learn and spread awareness throughout our community and is the first step to helping so many people gain the recognition and respect that they deserve. Thank you for taking the time to listen to what we said and we look forward to your outcome. Thank you. Our next speaker is Josie uh, Bosart. Hope I did better on your name this week. Uh, and that will be followed by Tara Marsh for your final speech. Um, hi. My name is Josie Bizart. Um, I'm a current senior at Vista Lago High School, and I'm here today in support of recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day in the Folsom Cordova Unified School District. Also, I want to say the Title VI um, Native People like Education Program, that sounds really cool, and I think that would also be a really good step in recognizing Indigenous people further in our district. So at the previous board meeting in December, I believe that some of our like speeches and stuff led to the idea that we believe the district supports Columbus Day. Um, we do not believe this. We know that the district does not officially recognize Columbus Day. And we are asking the Folsom, Unifi Folsom Cordova Unified School District to recognize the second Monday of October, which students frequently get off school, as Indigenous Peoples Day. Other districts and states have already recognized Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, as of now, the second Monday of October is one of 11 official federal holidays, and Indigenous Peoples Day is recognized in states including Alaska, New Mexico, Rhode Island, South Dakota, uh, Washington, D.C., Vermont, and Maine, to mention a few. Um, and according to the New York Times, more than 100 cities have adopted this holiday, including cities like Berkeley, Seattle, and Minneapolis. In 2022, um, California Governor Gavin Newsom made an ed editorial proclamation recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day on the second Monday of October as well. And we want our district to be more inclusive. We want our district to like be a place where all students can feel welcome. And our district has talked about becoming more inclusive, so we want to actually take some steps to make our district as inclusive as it can be. Recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day won't harm anyone. In fact, it can do the opposite by providing an opportunity to teach students compassion and help Indigenous students connect with their culture. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And final in-person speaker, Tara Marshall. Welcome. Thank you. Hey, Young. Tara Marshall, Holiet, Natenewe Ate, Tetia, Notsung, Dick Young. I just said hi. My name is Tara Marshall in Hoopa. I'm a member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe of California, and I'm happy to be here with you tonight. My father, Malin Marshall, was probably the first Native American who um, worked in the school district at Rancho Cordova Elementary back in 1960. He worked there from 1960 to 1970. He was a fifth grade teacher and was, um, he had a lot of Aerojet um, engineer students, so he, they kept him on his toes. Um, he later went on to work for the California Department of Education as a consultant for Native educational policies. My dad loved his job and his students. Um, he inspired me to become a teacher and he brought taught me to be proud of my indigenous heritage. I'm here to, um, tonight to add my voice to the indigenous students who have been asking that Indig Indigenous People Day be added to our calendar. Why should we add an Indigenous People's Day to our, our calendar? 
because as a native myself, it is important for our students to know that we honor the peoples who inhabited this continent for thousands of years and that we recognize and acknowledge the vast contributions Native Americans have provided to our society from before European colonization up until our present time. Throughout history, indigenous people have cherished and safeguarded their unique cultures, um, preserving their land, language, spirit, tradition, and knowledge for generations to come. Secretary of the Interior, Deb Hollins has said, we celebrate the strength of indigenous communities, the traditions and cultures that have served millennia and our fervent hope for the future. Last year, Governor Newsom issued a proclamation recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day. It would speak volumes to our community if our district added Indigenous, Indigenous Peoples Day to our calendar. Please consider doing so. Now my next comments will be addressing my work and role as a Montessori teacher at Carl Sundell Elementary. I'm in my eighth year there and have loved the opportunity to guide so many precious three to six year old children. As you know, I came to last month's board meeting and spoke about the possibility of the program being phased out. Tonight, I'd like to talk briefly about the known benefits of early childhood education, not just for four-year-olds or TK students, but also for three-year-olds. Research, re, research shows that early childhood education has at least four to nine times return on investment per dollar, and not only benefits the health, education, and development of young children, but also leads to increased earnings, employment, and safety in the future. Offering quality education, early, edu early childhood education, means students are more likely to finish high school, students perform better academically in later grades, students are less likely to repeat a grade, students are less likely to be identified as having special needs, um, students gain confidence, a high quality education, um, childhood education bridges the achievement gap for students from lower socioeconomic groups. Montessori education has been around for over 100 years and has earned a reputation for being one of the best ways of educating young children. The Montessori class at Carl Sandal was created in 2013 with a lot of hard work and dedication. It would truly be a travesty to phase it out when it meets the needs of so many parents in the community and when there, where there's a large or waiting list, a long waiting list every year. We could easily add a Montessori TK class in the afternoon, combining the kindergartners from the morning class. That would add 12 to 16 TK slots on top of the eight TKs from the morning class. That's 20 to 24 TK slots. Next month, if you are presented with a recommendation to phase out the program, the Montessori program, please consider these things. Thank you. Thank you. I will be taking online comments. Uh, we have anybody online? Crathy? Crathy, are you there? I'm here. Are you able to hear me? We can. Yeah, welcome. Thank you so much. And um, I just, since it's there were so many topics in between, I just want to come back to say this is the topic of the new high school in um, Folsom Ranch. So good evening, everyone. My name is Prati Chalagala. I have been a resident of this wonderful city since 2007. So clearly I'm not from Folsom Ranch, the other side of Folsom. Um, we have been in the school system from the past decade and quote, it's definitely the best schools, best experience we've had. And I still think these are the best schools in the Sacramento region. Um, I have a student at Vista and Folsom Middle currently. And I can only think of positive experiences from our journey and always, always trusted the school board that they will make the best decisions for all the students and their families. When we moved to Folsom in 2007, that was the year Vista del Lago High School was established at that time, primarily to relieve overcrowding at Folsom High School. And right now we have both schools at capacity, if not beyond capacity, and soon to be beyond, beyond capacity in Folsom High too. And the influx of students that will be coming in from Folsom Ranch is definitely concerning to me. Um, Folsom School District has always stood high in their rankings, and we would all want to maintain and continue that for the future generations. All the students in Folsom rightfully should have an equal opportunity and availability of resources, irrespective of where they come from which is why it really begs the need for a new high school to be established in Folsom Ranch as soon as possible to avoid any future disruptions whatsoever. Growing up, my kids had the best group of friends that stuck together during elementary, middle, and now into even high school. 
there were three kids in, in their group who were separated after Folsom Middle. Um, and they had to go to Folsom High because they were residents of Folsom Ranch. It, it was a very emotional journey for all of them. High school is a new chapter in their lives, exciting at the same time, most kids are nervous to start this new journey. The emotional bond and support is what makes them strong when they're around their childhood friends on that first day of school, knowing that they can meet during breaks. It can only contribute to their mental well-being. And in this day and age, we all know the importance of that. So the more we can do to keep these kids together from early on is the best gift we can do as for the future generation. I, I will take leave with this final thought, though, sincerely trust and hope that the board will make a decision that will support the Folsom Ranch students rightfully for what they need. Um, thank you so much for your time and for giving me this opportunity to speak in front of the board. Thank you, Crescent. Sarah, Sarah, welcome. Hi, um, my name is Sarah and I'm a parent of a fourth grader at Theodore Judah and an eighth grader at Sutter. I have lived in Folsom, north of 50 since um, 2005. And so I'm not new here. And I have seen Folsom grow a lot. I also volunteer in the community through Intel, Boy Scouts and my kids' schools. This is my second year on the PTO board at Theodore Judah, and I served a year on the PTO board at Sutter. I am here today to talk about the overcrowding in our schools. Um, my eighth grader has a math class in Folsom High, and so we are exposed to the issues at both the <laughs> middle and the high school level. Um, there was again an influx of more kids into both these schools this year, and they're above capacity. Um, incoming sixth graders this year no longer get the electives that their older peers got. So like my son got Spanish in sixth grade. That is no longer an option. They did, um, you know, they had more music instruments and things like that. Even in fourth grade, my fourth grader got his violin like a couple of days ago. Um, all the clubs, again, in middle and high school are all overcrowded that many kids don't get to participate. And at high school, it's getting worse. We're getting honors classes and AP classes is getting to be impossible. It is harder to get a teacher's time or tutoring help for struggling students. And um, you can talk to many of the principals, like because Intel has like volunteer help going into some of the schools to tutor with math. And there are so many kids that need it. Um, it has come to a point that teachers and counselors are discouraging many kids from, from advanced classes as they can't accommodate so many and neither are they able to help struggling kids. This is such a great disservice to these kids. And this, I'm not sure this is the right way to go going forward. And I am I think we can do better. And I'm worried that things will get far worse by the time my younger child hits high school in four years. So I'm hoping that, you know, we start work on another high school in Folsom to relieve this stress. I hope the board will do right by our students and our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, that is all the online comments. Uh, so that ends public comment. That brings us to item nine, reports of district organizations. We'll start with the Student Advisory Board. Good evening, FCUSD. The Student Advisory Board would like to recognize our collaboration to highlight the attendance challenge in our district from January 2nd to the 31st. Our video was shown across the district, reaching students, parents, and faculty. Student voice is really important, and we are glad that we got to display it with this video. Our next meeting is February 7th. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morel, Joy. And next up then is California School Employees Association. Good evening. My name is Omera Johnson. I'm Vice President of California School Employee Association. And let me thank you, Sarah, for your, or congratulate you on your retirement. It's great. It's great. <laughs> um, we are in the midst of working with <clears throat> the negotiation team and looking forward for positive things to happen. I uh, understand there's trying times, but we want to work together. Thank you. Thank you. Wilson Cordova uh, Education Association. 
Good evening, everybody. Um, so good evening and happy new year to everybody. So this is the first meeting we've had since in 2024. It seems a long time ago. Um, so board, um, FCUSD administrators, our teachers from Vista Del Argo and Oak Chan Elementary Schools um, who are in attendance this evening. As we enter the year of, uh, new year of 2024, FCEA looks forward to continuing to building the partnership with FCUSD in all aspects, curriculum, working conditions, and giving our students the education they deserve. Yesterday, I attended the governor's budget at workshop given by School Services of California. They have forecasted an educational budget that's not as bad as I thought, but not as good as I hoped, or that they project in that they projected in um, July of last year. However, the governor's budget did protect our community schools, existing allocated dollars of 22-23, and ongoing funding for our students. What we don't know is how our legislation will react to the budget and the state's ongoing deficit spending. As we work together in partnership on how we will navigate future fiscal decisions, FCA will continue to commit our focus to be um, student-centered when we had hard choices we will need to make while protecting teachers' rights, working conditions, and monetary needs. FCA will still strive to keep this district on the path of excellence for all. Thank you. Thank you. Folsom Cordova Leadership Association. Welcome back up. As if I haven't said enough. Um, FCLA would like to highlight the uh, recognition and the triumph of three outstanding students within our AXA community. These students are Gabriel Benar Ramirez from Kenny High School, Michael Cruz from Cordova High School, and uh, Svetlana Prinu Cheyenne from Folsom Middle. I apologize if I chopped up the name. They have not only ex excelled academically, but have demonstrated incredible resilience and determination in overcoming significant obstacles. Their success is a testament to the collaboration efforts of our dedicated administrators, educators, board members, teachers, paraprofessionals, guardians, community members, and everyone who has played a role in supporting them on their journey. These students are being recognized for every student succeed through AXA. As we honor these students, we must also recognize the collective efforts of access administrators and FCLA administrators, um, their commitment to creating an environment that fosters growth, inclusivity, and support has been instrumental in shaping the success story that we're celebrating. The impact of leaders go beyond the confines of the classroom, reaching into the lives of students who need the most and extra help to push them to, to thrive. To our board members, teachers, paraprofessionals, and community members, your unwavering dedication to the well-being and development of our students has not gone unnoticed. Your guidance, mentorship, and encouragement have paved the way for these young individuals to rise above challenges that have otherwise seemed unsurmountable. Each of them have a unique story of triumph. Showcasing the diversity of challenges that our students face and conquer every day, we want to acknowledge students who have challenged their, that have changed their attitudes, overcome physical and mental barriers, and battled to excel at school. Each triumph is a testament to the nurturing environment created by FCLA and this district in our school communities. We will be celebrating these students at the AXA Region Three Every Student Succeeds event on March fourth. These uh, these are not only uh, about individual success, but also about a reflection of the collaboration spirit that defines FCLA community. Let us combine, let us continue to inspire and support one another, ensuring that every student has the opportunity to overcome obstacles and reach their full potential. Special thanks goes out to Dr. Terry uh, Daniels, Dr. Ayana Pease, Amy Strawn, Alan Sims, and Suzanne Borth for their above and beyond support of these students. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, the District English Learner Advisory Committee. Ms. Cabrera couldn't be with us this evening, so I'm doing the uh, report for her. Um, the last meeting took place on January 11th, and the team discussed uh, both the dashboard as well as um, the components for students who were getting the seal of biliteracy. Also, um, Ms. Cabrera would like to invite uh, parents community members out for our next parent summit which is February 3rd from 8.30 in the morning to noon at Cordova, I'm sorry, Rancho Cordova Elementary School. 
So there's flyers around uh, the district, and uh, always, as always, we invite parents and uh, the community to come out and be part of that event. Thank you. All right, that brings us to agenda item 10, agenda consent. We will be pulling items H and I so that our student board members can abstain from that vote. Uh, is there any other item that a board member would like to pull from agenda consent? I'm not hearing. Is there a motion to approve the agenda consent uh, with the exceptions of item H and I? I'll move it. Uh, motion by Mr. Reed. I'll second. The second by Mr. Clark, uh, Superintendent. Mr. Mellinger. Aye. Mr. Merrill. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Ms. Uh, Larratt. Aye. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Hilly. Aye. Motion carries 4 0. Thank you. Great. And that brings us to agenda consent item H. Superintendent. Yes, uh, item H is uh, expulsion recommendation um, that we're bringing forward to the board. We pull it off the agenda, um, so it gives the students an opportunity to abstain from that vote. Great. Is there a motion to approve item H? I'll move it. Motion by Mr. Reed. I'll second. Second by Ms. Larratt. Superintendent. Mr. Mellinger. Abstain. Mr. Merrill. Abstain. Mr. Clark. Aye. Ms. Larratt. Aye. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Hooley. Aye. Motion carries 4-0. All right. And one of uh, two abstentions. Sorry. Thank you. Brings us to item I, approve expulsion re-entry recommendation case number 2223-6S. Again, we're recommending um, approval for this and giving the students a chance to abstain. Is there a motion? I'll move it. Motion by Mr. Clark. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Ms. Larratt, Superintendent. Mr. Mellinger. Abstain. Mr. Merrill. Abstain. Mr. Clark. Aye. Ms. Larratt. Aye. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Hooley. Aye. Motion carries 4-0. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings us now to dis uh, item 11, discussion action. Uh, item A, approve creation of school facility improvement district, SFID number three subcommittee. Mr. Huey, before we go there, may I make a couple oh, of introductions? Of course. Thank you. <laughs> yes, part of the consent agenda was approving the personnel action form on which we have two uh, new management positions that were approved tonight. And we would like to take this opportunity to welcome our newest members to the team who are sitting here in front. Uh, these are our two newest members to our expanded learning uh, program, and they're both serving as supervisor roles. So we are very excited to announce and introduce Mickey Frazier and Kamina Staples. Both will be expanded <coughs> learning supervisors and will work closely with staff and principals to provide an enriching and educationally sound experience for our students in our expanded learning program. Little background, Kamina Staples has 18 years of experience in the education field. Kamina Staples has served in various roles such as camp leader, after school educator, after school supervisor, program director, preschool teacher, preschool director, and field director for public and private educational institutions throughout California. She is excited to be part of the FCUSD family. She looks forward to contributing her wealth of knowledge and skills to the mission of serving students and supporting their achievement. And with that, I'm also going to introduce Mickey Frazier, Michelle Mickey Frazier. She is better known as Mickey. Um, she comes to us with over 20 years of experience in education and a proven track record in creating and managing expanded learning initiatives. In her most recent duties as the director of after school programs for Head Royce School in Oakland, she established a cross divisional department serving hundreds of students annually. Grounded in a commitment to serving students, she prioritizes the question what's best for our kids as a guiding principle and decision making from program development to addressing personnel concerns. She is excited to join the team at FCUSD and deepen the positive impact for all students. So welcome Kamina and welcome Mickey. Thank you, Thank you guys. <laughs> welcome and congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Of course, yeah, thank you for having me. Now that moves us to item 11, discussion action. Uh, item A, approved creation of school facility improvement district, SFID number three subcommittee. Superintendent. Yes, at our January 8th study session, um, we had a presentation on SFID, school facility improvement district three, um, and uh, next steps for us to take as a district, which the board gave us direction to form a um, community partners subcommittee made up um, of recommendations from the board and our two student board members our leadership of our um, uh, labor organizations and our board subcommittee of facilities and growth along with district staff. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Martin who will um, 
facilitate this discussion. And um, after we complete that discussion, we hope to have a board action on approving the committee members. Yes, yes, good evening. And so this was a request from the board at our last study session as Dr. Cleegan shared. Um, and so what our, our outline is, is shared here in the rationale. Um, and so we will have a rather large committee, but we hope to have a good representative uh, group uh, with the student board members, uh, two board members, um, as well as representatives from our labor partners. And then um, as you see, the representatives that each of you will be um, identifying and putting forward a name um, representing each side of the community, uh, our two communities. And so at this point, we are here to just answer any questions. If the board wants to give us some direction as well about some of the priorities or areas that you would like us to focus on um, with the committee, uh, we, we identified here some of the highlighted items. There's kind of three. We, we were trying not to create too big of a, of a list, uh, but the intent here was to try to provide um, some, some information to the, to the committee of what their task or purpose is and then correspondingly answer or bring uh, content that we can bring back to the board to help in the decision-making process. Um, our plan is we are uh, planning to have uh, one of our staff members, Kate Hazarian, um, our Director of Strategic Initiatives, uh, she will be facilitating it. Um, we thought that'd be better than myself or Matt since we will probably be um, content experts and provide information for the group. So that'll make it easier for us to be able to dialogue with the group and participate. Uh, and so she'll be able to facilitate the conversations between um, all of the members. So that's the plan or the idea. Um, we, we hope with this large of a group and the timeline with it, uh, we, we still have to identify all the, the, the members. Um, we're, we're planning probably, it'll be February, late February probably, maybe early March, I'm not gonna, Guarantee it. You, you, as you all know, getting this many people together um, for a, a you know an hour, two hour meeting, probably probably a couple hours for the first meeting. You know, based off of what the board directs, this may be multiple meetings before we will be able to back come back with any some sort of recommendation or conclusion. Um, and so, I just want to be realistic on the timelines with some of these things as well. So, okay. all right. Thank you. Uh, so with that, we'll bring it first, I guess, to questions from the board, and, and then we'll go out to public and come back with a little bit more direction okay. um, with what you mentioned. So uh, questions from the board around the committee, subcommittee. Yeah, I have a question. Thank you, Mr. President. Is there, uh, I was looking at the description in the agenda, and it seems that the adult board members are allowed to appoint one individual of their choice. Is that correct? They're, they're, they had so assigned two one from the Folsom community area and one from the Rancho Cordova. Is so there a specific reason why Van and I are not allowed to pick two students likewise? Is there some ed code prohibiting that because we would like to also? Uh, nope, it was just based off of the original direction of the board. So if, if you would like to add or change the makeup of the board, the only thing I would speak to is obviously the more people we add, just we have to accommodate everybody's schedules to get more and more people involved. But there would be no requirement that this is an ad, you know, more or less a, a voluntary committee that the board is creating so there isn't any defined representation um, that is required so thank you yeah mr clark so just to understand um, his request they would be able to appoint one <clears throat> each so well, whatever you guys would like to to create oh, so yeah you, you guys Miller's discuss order. yeah um i mean oh one student from each um, side would be great. One from so you're talking four, four students in total with me, Matthew, and then each of our representatives from our city. So it just add two more to the just two four total. Yeah, four, four total. So I wouldn't have a problem with that. I don't see any problem with scheduling and stuff because um, I mean a student schedule is pretty valuable as long as it's after school they can most. I, likely I would make imagine it. that they're pretty much in the evenings. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I don't have a problem with it. Yeah, from what I recall in the discussion, I know we had mentioned that the two of you would be on the board or on the uh, subcommittee, and I, I thought we had mentioned also the possibility of other students. We just maybe didn't provide direction around that. Um, so I don't know if there's other thoughts with board members around, you know, if that's uh, <coughs> acceptable or not. Um, I'd be fine with that as well. 
Looks like there's consensus. So uh, we can add that. And then <coughs> if, if each of you, um, I suppose you'll get an email from Mr. Martin or Dr. Kligan around who you'd like to appoint and with their contact information as well. Um, one thing I, I would like in the case of the city of Folsom for the student that is selected from Folsom to be from Folsom High. Um, we don't have any representative from Folsom High uh, on the school board, so I'd like that student to come from that high school. I have some people in mind, so <laughs> from Folsom High, yeah. Yeah, so. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the board around the subcommittee? Yeah, I'm not hearing any, so I will uh, bring it out to public comment. I don't have any in-person public comment. Is there any online public comment? No comment. Okay, back to the board then uh, for, it sounds like some direction for Mr. Martin, particularly around uh, what we'd like to focus on, particularly that first meeting and moving forward with this subcommittee. Um, so I'm gonna bring it out to the board uh, with this subcommittee. What are you know some of, some of the uh, top things we would like that committee to think about, especially right away? Um, Mr. President? Yep. Yeah, uh, on the three bullets that are listed, I mean, I, I, I think the three bullets are good. Um, I guess I wouldn't mind a fourth bullet that said something along the lines of consider uh, creative and outside the box solutions. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want, I want this committee to feel empowered to, to be creative. Uh, and not just simply follow, well, this is the way other school districts do it. This is the way we, this district has always done it. You know, I, I really think um, creativity in this instance would be beneficial uh, to the district. Um, the other thing as for, I guess, speed, if you will, um, I, I admittedly was, I mean, I voted for this, but I was admittedly, I didn't express it last week, but I was admittedly, admittedly a little apprehensive in creating this subcommittee uh, for one particular reason. Um, I am concerned that we're just creating another layer of bureaucracy that's going to slow the process down uh, and that, you know, a year from now we'll be hearing a report from a subcommittee. <laughs> the fact of the matter is we just need to make a decision. Um, and I don't want this to become an impediment to making a decision in a, a timely manner. And uh, so I would encourage whatever this committee is, is, is going to come up with, that they come up with it quickly, not um, a, a long drawn out process, because in the end, we're gonna be hurting our district if we delay this process. So, um, but, you know, like I said, I voted for it. Um, you know, I just would like to see this uh, to, to be um, timely, so. Great. And just to clarify, those three bullet points are locations of the new school, uh, ensuring equitable distribution of the remaining funds uh, and, and the funds that have been spent, and then um, methods to fund facility costs, um, incre including increasing the taxes in excess of $500 per 100,000. Um, so, and I agree, Mr. Reed, uh, as well with, you know, adding that fourth bullet of what are some other solutions that we're not thinking about, allowing some time to you know, dream about that and throw some other ideas out there. Any other thoughts around, uh, beyond those three bullet points or what Mr. Reed's mentioned, um, what we would like this subcommittee to be focused on? I don't think we should give them too many bullet points. To be honest, if we were looking for expediency, I think the more bullet points we add to their plate, the longer that's going to draw that out. So if we're asking them to do that, I would rather them focus on these really core items that we're really asking them to do and not get in the weeds on other issues. So I think if we can kind of limit it to these three or four, um, I'm fine with the fourth bullet um, to, to really empower them to, to really be focused. Yeah, I, I would add for me, I, I wouldn't add any more, but maybe a. Um, on that third bullet point around what this tax might end up being. Um, I, I would want an emphasis, and for me, this is kind of the number one priority of the subcommittee, um, of being able to gauge the public's willingness to spend $580 potentially out of every $100,000 of assessed value uh, to build a, a high school or other schools. Um, that's, to me, that is the, 
I mean, I, I won't feel comfortable voting yes on anything unless I know that the community there is willing to do that. Yeah. Uh, and even if I know they are, it's going to be probably hard to get there. So I, I would just add, the biggest priority for me is how do we gauge whether this is true or not, both for the people in this committee and then, you know, uh, I guess using the people in this committee and other means to gauge the the, uh, the rest of that community, not just the people in the subcommittee. Um, so it, for my two cents, that's, that is the most important thing I, I want to get out of this. Yeah, and actually, uh, now that you mentioned that, um, I, I agree with you 100%. I, I would actually defer my bullet point to that bullet point because I think that is probably the most uh, important question that needs to be answered. I guess it makes sense if if we find that the answer to that is we're not willing to pay that tax rate, well, we probably don't need to spend a lot of energy figuring out where to build the school, yeah. uh, how to equitably, equitably distribute the funds. We want to. We still want to focus on that with the funds we have left, but um, yeah, if, if it sounds like maybe the board is on board with, you know, let's let's really make a strong focus on <laughs> can the, do the taxpayers have the the willingness and ability to pay up up to that amount? So, does that feel like enough direction, Mr. Martin? Yes, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we do need uh, a motion to approve the subcommittee. Uh, is there a motion? I'll move it. All right. Motion by Mr. Clark. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Mr. Mellinger, Superintendent. Mr. Mellinger. Aye. Mr. Merrill. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Ms. Lara. Aye. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Hooley. Aye. The motion carries 4-0. Thank you. And just to clarify, do we have all the names submitted to Rochelle? <clears throat> Not yet. Okay. So we'll be working with the board members to get those names and student board members. Mm, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that brings us to uh, item 12, discussion. And uh, first discussion item, a superintendent search discussion with consultants. Superintendent, would you like to introduce this item? Sure. Um, at our last uh, Saturday study, study session on January 8th, we um, entertained uh, inter uh, interviewing firms, search firms for um, searching for the next superintendent of Folsom Cordova. And the board chose McPherson Jacobson, and they are here with us this evening. Um, Nicole Anderson and Dr. S Dr. Sonny DeMardo, who are going to lay out a timeline and a plan and talk about um, the process for engaging our community partners through this process. And with that, I welcome you both and turn it over to you. Good evening, Board of Trustees. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you again and honored that you selected us to uh, partner with you on this very important decision you'll be making uh, to hire your next superintendent and to continue the legacy work of your retiring superintendent. So again, congratulations. Um, very bittersweet as I call it, um, as you get ready to uh, venture into what I call living your best life. So we thank you for your service. I um, also wanna honor the community who's here, the staff um, who will all be a part of this process based on our conversation. So I'm excited for those who are still here and those who are also watching from the virtual space, including potential candidates who have already started to reach out and are already interested in learning more about um, if this is you know, the great fit for them. Um, so Dr. Sunny and I are here and we're gonna kind of walk you through a few things. So it's gonna take a moment, but hopefully the documents we shared with you, you got a chance to review them. So it'll probably fast forward this process. Uh, we tried to give you as much as possible um, based on our kind of best practices we use in our firm. Um, but tonight is really an opportunity for you to ask questions, uh, learn as much about the process. And of course, we will be in touch with you individually to really learn a little bit more about your perspective on this process. Um, and throughout the entire process, any questions you have, you can reach out to us and we'll be giving you ongoing updates. So tonight will be quite a bit that we wanna cover so we can get the ball rolling, uh, but we'll continue to be with you every step of the way. So what we thought, um, a couple things we wanna take care of, just some logistics, is first we want to identify who will be your point of contact. So it is important that while we wanna work closely with you, you all are busy and you won't be able to have time for us um, to go through all the logistics that happen during the search. 
So we want to just get quickly your feedback. Um, so far, we've been working with Sean Martin, which has been great just in the short period of time. Um, so we just want to make sure we can identify who is that official person who will kind of go back and forth with through the process, um, who also communicate with you as the board. Um, we often, we know uh, that your current superintendent, Dr. Collegian, is, has been um, obviously your kind of support in terms of giving information, but we also want to honor her current role as a busy superintendent. And typically, we don't have the superintendent involved in the process. Process, uh, but definitely um, uh, the facilitation and how you all have best practices here, we want to honor, but definitely want to have that person um, identify tonight so that we can really get the ball rolling. So do you all have um, officially who your point of contact will be? And so far it's been Sean, and I know he's like, oh, you're volunteering. Nicole, a question, uh, how's yeah. the communication <laughs> been, Sean, with, with the firm? Wonderful. I mean, has it been too <laughs> overwhelming? Right. No, oh, no, no. And, and honestly, let, I'll be honest, uh, Lorena and, and Rochelle have been really the people that have okay. completed the actual, the day-to-day -day components of it. So <laughs> I want to give them full credit. But yeah. I, I'm, I'm fine supporting the board. If you would like me to, to continue in that role, that's fine. Yeah, in most cases, it's the secretary of the board, but that yeah. would be the superintendent. So that's right. not going to work. Um, I don't see any problem with... Uh, Mr. Martin continuing to uh, carry on the duties and being in contact with you. Okay. Um, Ms. Anderson, one quick question. Um, do any school districts ever, um, you know, they identify the point of contact? And I actually agree 100% that uh, I think Sean would be the, the right person for uh, the board. But do they ever, uh, do you ever like CC the board president in the communications? Yeah, so a lot of times, this, again, this is your search. So we always right. customize it based on what works for you. Sometimes we have board presidents who are so busy, they're like, I can't, right? So we just have a point of contact. And then we do an ongoing, usually um, several times during the search, you'll hear maybe once a month at least, but you'll, you'll get ongoing communication from us as a team, and it really goes to everyone, right? Um, so it's really up to you what works well. Um, we can CC, definitely, uh, President Hoy is fine, um, or we can just go through your point of contact who can then communicate with the board. Um, obviously, you have your staff who helps with some of the logistics, and that's fine. We just need to know, like, who is that point of contact because often it's really hard for us, like herding cats, as we call it. Um, we do want to keep in mind one piece is that because it's a process where anyone can apply, we also want to be mindful that if you have any internal candidates, right, we want to be mindful that at a point where that could be a conflict if at any point, we would usually say, okay, hey, we need to make sure we've picked another person um, for the confidentiality piece, right? Um, so the point of contact, I think, is fine. Um, and if we get to a point where we feel like we need to have any adjustments, we would just reach out. So it varies from district to district, but typically it's it's usually um, the assistant to the superintendent has been that person. Um, typically it's not the outgoing superintendent though. We try to kind of honor their space and not keep that pressure on them. Um, so we, it, it's, it varies, but it's what you really want. So we can CC if you like, if that works well, it's not a problem. Just let I, us know. If you guys all want me CC'd, I'm happy to get them. But I, I think, you know, I would trust as long as Mr. Martin has the bandwidth, it sounds like right. yeah, that's not going to be an issue. Um, so, I, I mean, I would trust Mr. Martin's discretion around yeah. okay. you know, if there is a particular message that needs to go to the board president or somebody else, yeah. he would push that along. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you're communicating with the board as a whole. I think that works yeah. great. Uh, you know, the other, the only other time I could think of where maybe it would want to come through me is if we ha do have an agendized item that we need to discuss to make yeah. sure that it's okay on here. Yeah, so I was just going to share, we're going to go through the calendar in a moment, and you're going to see there are several board meetings that we will need to agendize some things or some that we're going to have to take action. And then also you have some closed session items that are confidential in nature where it really would just be us communicating um, because of the confidentiality of, you know, like the applicants. When we start to share that, that usually goes directly um, to the team, really. So, um, so I think, you know, this will help. You feel better once we've gone through the calendar, and um, I think it's fine um, if Sean's willing to. And at any point you feel overwhelmed, you say that. Um, we often have to remind people our job, you hired us to facilitate and do the behind the scenes work. So it really should be we make it as simple as possible. 
The hardest part of the work is typically getting the stakeholder input groups together. Um, and that typically takes a team because you got to outreach to folks, right? I saw, I've heard people speak tonight who I think would be great to bring to these input sessions. So that part is like herding cats, as we say. Um, but we will help create a schedule that will allow that to happen. So that's typically the part we need you all because we don't have that contact. I think that sounds good. So it sounds like we're we're kind of honing in on Mr. Martin being the point right. of contact. I just want to kind of check in everybody on the board, student board members, everybody's good with that. All okay. right. Perfect. Congratulations. No. Okay. <laughs> so uh, with that being said, um, we also, um, one of the logistical pieces is so that we can communicate effectively, effectively with you all. There's a form that will, um, I think is actually being worked on with all the board member information. When we create our brochure, we want to make sure we have all that very accurate. So that be the one of the kind of first steps we'll follow up on. Um, but overall, um, we want to kind of get in. Do we miss anything, by the way? No. Okay. All right. So um, overall, what we want to start with is the calendar itself, and that will guide the process. So we're, we're going to go through it pretty quickly. I think you all got a chance to look at it. Um, there is a point where we're going to ask you all to pull out your calendars, make sure these dates work. Um, we tried to work around um, normally what our process is, right, based on the timeline of hiring someone to start July 1st. So we kind of backwards mapped. We looked at your um, governance calendar. So we tried to infuse them into some of your current meetings. And so, and when we gave some options for some of the dates that um, we, we may not know what your availability is. So what I'm gonna do, we're just gonna quickly go through it, okay? And then we're gonna actually go through some of the details um, as you get ready to kind of talk about some of the um, important aspects like the stakeholder input sessions. We'll go into more detail. Um, so, Cause we're actually wanna have, ask you about who you want to have as part of that process. Um, we're going to spend some time talking about advertising costs just to make sure you all can identify what you, how you want this, this job to post and what the uh, venues are and just get a sense of what the cost would be. And then, of course, we want to go through the criteria, like what is going to be that um, job criteria for your next superintendent. Okay. So um, starting off, any questions about this first? Like we all had it and was there anything that stuck out right away? Okay. So really quick. Obviously tonight you see um, in highlighted in yellow, um, you'll see we'll have three touch points with you as far as regular meetings. These are public, it's a transparent process, and then you'll see a few closed session. So starting off, um, you can notice the dates on the left and then you'll see um, actually the activity and we include for you, it's pretty detailed, we tell you what we're doing in between those meetings so you have a sense of what's going on. So that's why it's pretty detailed calendar. So what you can see, obviously, tonight, we're going to take care of a couple of things of business. After tonight, we're going to follow up with you all um, individually about making sure that you can give us um, feedback on your draft criteria. So that will be an individual email to you each individually. We can also have a conversation on the phone. Um, and so we'll probably talk about what that deadline looks like um, when we get to the criteria. You'll notice after that, um, we gave kind of a timeline that's typical around preparing for advertising. So our mind is thinking based on your plan that we can start around February 1st, okay, to start the advertisement. Um, obviously, recruitment um, has already begun. Um, we have um, also have to set up with Sean and the team the stakeholder input sessions, uh, meetings. Those take a little bit of time. So you can see all of this is going on. And at that same time, we also will be sending some updates on the process. Yeah, just and, to clarify, yep. Ms. Anderson, the, that January 19th through January 26th, yep. I, I think you said that's that'll be an individual phone call. That's not something the board <laughs> has to be together for. Special no, meetings. no. So okay. what we do is we'll actually individually contact you via email. Sometimes it's easy to just blind CC you all. You get the same message, but then you respond to us. So that way there's no issue about Brown Act or anything of that nature. So that's all kind of going on simultaneously, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so you can see on the second page, um, we're going into advertisement. So um, we looked at possibly advertising for about a month and a half, which is pretty typical. Um, there are some guidelines for advertising um, the actual position. There's some actual uh, time frame. So that's what you see uh, listed there based on what is very typical. And we'll walk through that in a moment. Uh, you can see after that, um, February 5th, which is going to come pretty quickly, um, we usually use about a two-week time frame to try to get as many of your stakeholders to be a part of the process um, of giving us input around what they want to see in their new superintendent, uh, what are some of the issues, and what's you know great about your community, what's great about the schools. And that's super important for us to go through that. 
So you can see that we also have an online survey that we'll have uh, present for you all to allow for those that don't have access to coming in person or coming to the Zoom space, that they actually can just do the online survey. So it's really a lot of feedback that you get and try to give as many platforms as possible. Um, one thing we will ask you about is languages. So making sure that interpretation is, is, is provided for uh, different languages uh, based on what you typically do in your district. And so you can see, um, and we're not gonna go through this right this second, we'll do this in a moment, but you can see there's a laundry list of options of people that you may want to invite to these input sessions. Okay, so we'll talk about those. And I've started to add some, some names um, that you don't see on there just based on observing several of your board meetings. So we'll talk about that in a moment, okay? So you can see that two weeks comes by, and I know one of the things that's going on at the same time is you all will have a draft criteria of your superintendent kind of uh, um, job description, but these input sessions will also um, help you to solidify that, right, once you hear the input from your uh, stakeholders. So you can see from February 19th through the 1st, we're continuously doing our advertisement. You can see that we're um, recruiting. Um, we definitely want to make sure you all have the updates, and then we also will be creating that report for you. So what you'll notice, your second board meeting will come back to you, the same venue, and we, we put March 7th based on uh, what's on your calendar, that we would come to you and actually share that input report. And that is a public document that would be shared and you all will get a chance to look at it, ask questions, and then to go back to your criteria, maybe there's any updates you want to make. Okay, so that's a pretty short meeting. Um, but there is another space where we do talk about your ad hoc committee. So as you're getting ready to prepare for interviews, we actually gonna start talking about, do you want a stakeholder committee? And you gotta start telling us, you have to start that process of who is gonna be on that interview panel. So we're gonna do that in your second meeting. Uh, and at the same time, we also um, will ask you to take action for that. So um, there's gonna be, um, I, I work with the point of contact as far as Sean around logistics and how that will work but you all will definitely have to do a little bit of homework and talk about who you actually want to have on that interview panel and you actually have to take action, okay? Because it's just similar to your committee you just uh, appointed. So Ms. that will all be happening there. Yes. Sorry. Uh, yep. So for that, uh, for that item, I'm assuming we would be filling you in that week or two before about who we might think should be on that committee and then we'll bring those names to the March 7th meeting? So what typically happens, and this kind of, it, it depends on how your meetings are going, but a lot of times, like we don't necessarily have to be at that meeting for y'all to have that discussion. So prior to this March 7th meeting, you may do that in a meeting prior when you're all together. And so what we usually do is communicate with you about the process. We have a composition list we give you, like, hey, how many teachers should you have? How many students? But it's really something you all can do without us. If you want us to, we can actually come to a meeting to help facilitate that. But typically, that's not always needed. So um, we can have that discussion. Um, I think um, I'm thinking uh, after the stakeholder input sessions, that'll be around the time that we can visit that conversation. And so I'm kind of sharing this with you now, so you're starting to think about if we're going to do an interview panel, who is going to be on there? And so uh, what we could do is give you some direction on how you can facilitate that in your meeting prior to us coming. Great. Yeah. Does that help? Mr. President, okay. yeah. I, I, if Mr. Clark is willing to shed some light on the, uh, he's the only board member who was on the, the last time we hired a superintendent. Yep. And I might be mistaken, Mr. Clark, but didn't the entire board engage, perform that interview process? Yeah, it was a two-day process. And I don't know if it's common practice that you all have an ad hoc committee or somebody that's on the interview panel outside yeah. of the board. Yeah. Uh, my previous experience, it was just the board, yeah. and it was a two-day yeah. yep. interview process with each of us asking questions. Yeah. So our, in my searches, I've done about 12 now um, mm -hmm. over the last you know five years or so, and almost all of them have had a stakeholder interview panel. Okay. Um, there's been some boards, like a closed process, we call it, which is just you all interview, you make that decision. Ours have all had, I mean, everyone I've done, and it's pretty common to have that stakeholder group, um, but it's not mandatory. You know, so you all can decide that. Um, we, we definitely want to know what you're thinking now, but you may need some time to think about it, which is fine, but it is a process that we um, actually recommend 
Um, their role, though, is a little different from the board. So their role is not to um, do a ranking or to say who's their favorite. Um, it's really about what are the strengths they see and then what are the areas of growth or concern. And then you get that as one of the many things you get to consider in your deliberations. So a lot of boards like that, actually. They really want to know what does the community think? You know, how did it? How did this person resonate with our teachers, with our parents, with our students? Like that's what a lot of boards are interested in. Um, so it's pretty common, but it also is not a mandatory thing. Um, yeah, I, I mean, if, yeah. if we can entertain some conversation now around yeah, how absolutely. Board feels around that, yeah. Um, yeah. Mr. President, yeah. you know, I guess my feeling is there are very few specific duties and responsibilities of a school board member. You know, among those responsibilities is to approve a budget, mm -hmm. is to um, uh, adopt policies, and to hire and or fire and supervise the superintendent. That is the responsibility of the school board, and I would prefer that the school board have that responsibility of interviewing all of the candidates. It, it seems to be the way that it's being described, and if see if I understand it correctly, that that ultimately that is what would happen. This would take place, but from at least the way it's happening in my head, the interview with the panel would take place prior to this large two-day interview that the board has with the candidate, uh, and it, then it would just be information that the board can use. Is that in my phone? Yeah, and it's the comp the schedule is pretty complicated. It's typically two days, but it's going on like you all will be interviewing with one person. The stakeholder group is going at the same time with another. So this is all happening during this two days. But prior to deliberation, everything is done, and you will get that information about what the stakeholder interview panel um, kind of feedback was, right? Um, but there's no ranking. They do not hire. They don't make any of those decisions. Boards just like getting that input. Um, and it's just helpful in addition to other things you consider. So do you want to add something to that? Uh, I was just going to say that uh, it's very important that you understand that that ad hoc committee does not make any recommendations to us. We sit there as consultants and we take notes and we determine through the interview process that they had with each of the candidates what they the feedback is to the board. And then the board is the only one that makes that decision. So, so do the, does the board interview all of the candidates just like the, the stakeholder committee does? Yes. And not like the, not exactly like, because the board has, there's two different ways that the board, that I've done it in searches. One is the board works together with, um, candidates and, and interviews them. And then they also have a social where they interview them more on a social basis, um, trying to get to know them, that kind of thing. But the board's the one that makes the decision together and asks the questions directly to the candidate. So every candidate that will be interviewed by this um, committee will then subsequently be interviewed by the entire board. Uh, that's up to the board. The board will make that decision after the feedback we give you from the uh, committees, so. So we could receive feedback from the committee and decide not to interview a candidate, essentially. Well, they, they wouldn't say not to interview, but okay. you may decide that from the, fee from the synopsis that we give you, that that's not somebody that you want to take the time at this point to interview. Yep. At least okay. that's the way I've done it. And, so. and that's my concern. I, I don't want anybody, you know, filtering out potential candidates that come before this board. And, and let's clarify. So again, they are their role is literally to give you uh, feedback on what they saw. And so if you we're going to come to you with typically a short list is how it how it ends, right? So you have these applications that closes. Um, we date we put the date on here of March 15th is a typical day. Um, we close the applications. We vet through those. We actually share with you who we feel, let's just say it was 30 people who applied. So we narrow that down and recommend to you what we call a short list. And that short list is who we actually would say, hey, take a look at them possibly through what we call video interviews. 
So you actually may be able to see them prior, and it's usually three questions we ask them. Um, it's all online. You get to see this recording, and that's your first layer of starting to filter out who you might want to interview. And then from there, what happens is we ask you to narrow it down, and typically you almost narrow it down to half of those. And those are the ones you say we're going to interview. Okay, from that point, you interview them and your stakeholder in, uh, panel interviews as well. And during those two days, they're simultaneously going on where you're actually, like uh, Dr. Sunny talked about the, you know, the social piece, right? We also have in that space that you can actually, we usually do two board members, right? You meet with that individual person who is an interviewee and you get to know them more on an informal basis. Then you also get to see them in a formal interview you then get to hear the input that uh, was given from your stakeholder panel, right? That tells you what they took from when they asked questions, what they got. Then you're going also, you have another set of information with their references, you have their application. So you have multiple layers of information before you to say, here's who our finalists will be. And so to Dr. DeMarcho's com uh, uh, comment about like you kind of get this input from them, but they're not the only thing you're considering when you get down to who is our finalist and even your second interview you may want to have, right? You may want to bring them back another day. But I think a lot of this is going to be in theory when you get to that place because you don't know who is applying right now, but you do want to decide pretty soon, like, are we going to actually have an interview panel that consists of our stakeholders and the value of that um, in, in many ways, I'm a fan of it. Some are not, but I'm a fan of it. And here's why. I'm a new superintendent coming into your district. And the first time I'm introduced to your key stakeholders is the day that you decide to take action. Hey, here's our new person. That introduction looks very different from, hey, there's a group of people who are part of this interview process who also got to weigh in, right, and look at who the different people were. So they're not a stranger, right? But they actually had a chance to be a part of that process. So now you're creating um, what I'd say a, a smoother partnership for this new person coming in. So I'm quite a fan of it, but I also know that there are boards who do what we call a closed session and don't have it at all. So it's, it's up to you all. Um, and you don't have to necessarily decide <laughs> tonight, but you do want to give us a sense, you know, before our next board yeah. meeting, because you're going to have to probably go through a process of making your recommendations. And eventually maybe we'll, we'll that give decision. it a couple more minutes and see if we have some consensus. Yeah, tonight. yeah let us sit, then, sit for a minute. Yeah. Uh, I mean, any other thoughts around the stakeholder? Uh, Miss Anderson, yeah. I, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe I'm just stuck in my ways, but <laughs> I'm willing to try something new. Um, my question would be, who are these stakeholders? How many stakeholders? Yep. And then my second question would be, what guidelines do you have in place? Yeah. Because, you know, some I stakeholders know may interview some, and then next thing you know, we're getting text messages, yeah. phone calls, I think so-and-so, yeah. and you guys yeah. should do. Yeah. I, I don't want this board to be put in that yeah. position. Yeah. You know, yeah. we've had a success, a track record of not having those issues. So it's a confidential process. And you'd be um, surprised. Well, I've done them a few times and I, I've had to be very. So he mentioned about a facilitator. So one, this is not their panel. This is not their process. It's yours. Right. So we often have the board president show up in the very beginning, do introductions. Thank you for being a part of this. But at the end of the day, this is your process and we facilitate. So we have a confidentiality forum. Everyone has to sign. Okay. Um, Mama Nicole comes out. And I do tell people, I know where you live, so do not ever, no, I'm kidding. But we're very serious about this. These are people's livelihood, and they need to honor the process. And I, honestly, it's never been an issue. Um, I think that's sometimes the worry. And you know your community better than us. So I think that I is also something you, but you also get to select who the people are who okay, are in there. Okay, that was my other question. Yes, that, that. That's you all appointing them. So I think being okay. really clear about that up front, um, and I love that this is a transparent, open process, even hearing this at a regular board meeting that people have to understand it's very serious to be selected for that particular panel. And there's some clear structures we use down to what interview questions they ask, down to the process of the, their own deliberation. And like I said, the mother Nicole and father Sonny comes out <laughs> and we, we are, we get very, we, we're in a very different space than the smiles you see today. It's a very serious process and we've had people honor it and they appreciate the process and they learn a lot too, but you all have to all feel comfortable with this. So <laughs> the, one of the other concerns I, I have is the time um, you're talking about 
the committee doing interviews simultaneously as we're doing them as well. I don't know, because we'll do it on a weekend. It's going to be a Saturday and Sunday, and it's probably going to be one of those eight to, I think last time we got days. out about 530. They're long days. Yeah. yeah, they're long days. So I'm just wondering if having this extra committee doing interviews is going to It does extend the time. the time. Yeah, the schedule is like a matrix. I mean, it really is like a science. You know, we have it down to science, but it does lengthen the day. But it also depends on how many candidates you have. If you are interviewing three, right, a three-person day looks different from five or six. So we make it all work, and the two days is pretty feasible, but it really depends on what you all want to do. So there's the social component. That adds time, right? So I've done it every way I can think of. Um, so we structure that day, the interview day, is based on what you all want. Okay, and I, I can't quite remember, and I know the other firm that we worked with gave us a, a short list, if you mm -hmm. want to call it. Yep. Um, what is your average short list? Is it? Five, three. So typically about ten, right? Eight to ten. It de it depends on applicants, it right? Be, yeah. yeah, it can be less. Yeah, it could be less. It could be. The yeah. last uh, search I was on, we had six. Okay. It, they was there was twenty some applicants, but the board it came down to six. It, it what we recommended to the board got it is narrowed it down to six. So okay. Yeah, and I've would... had I've had twelve. So it, it depends on the applicants. I yeah, think that, that would be one of my concerns is yeah. the longevity. Sure, we, we yeah. want to find the best superintendent yep. <laughs> for this district, but I'm, I'm just concerned about the time. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, you know, we, we've got to take our time if we want to find the best, but it, yeah. you know, between us and the stakeholders and going back and forth, and then we have to go back and, and, and you know, do the rankings and everything. Yep. And, and that's going to take a while too, because yeah. Among all of us, yeah, we're going to have to deliberate and, and and yeah. everything else. So it's. <laughs> I've had a few one thirty in the morning experiences. Yeah, yeah you're and, scaring me. But, but, but I'm no, just saying. Honestly, um, it's not many. Um, <laughs> they have gone very smooth. We have it down to science. It really is about your deliberation process at the end. We don't rush you. We've even right. said, hey, time out. Let's go home, go to sleep, come back the next day. But again, all this is in theory. You don't know, right? It could be some searches. It's just clear who the number one person is and it's gone pretty quickly so we don't know we haven't seen our applications yet true it's true and, and, and <laughs> what you just said about going home taking a nap and coming back the next day right now you know you're looking you at feel a little possibly <laughs> a no but you're looking at possibly a two-day process yeah, right and yep. i mean if you're sitting at home and you know coming back the next day, that might delay it until the next weekend where we're going to have to do it all over again. No, That's no. one of my concerns. Yeah. And, you know, I haven't had that. Yeah. like I said, we did it and it took, it took us hours. I mean, yeah. you know, I Very think we nice. were done, selected Sarah. I think, I think we called her in, offered her the position yeah. probably about five, five fifteen. I can't remember because I ended up staying at the hotel having dinner. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, it depends. Okay. I mean, one of the things you'll see, um, and I think it's um, if you scroll up a little bit to the um, interviews, mm -hmm. you can see I kind of broke it down <laughs> a little bit on like how the panels could look um, in terms of if you had the board interview, if you had the social piece, like all of those things play into it. But our schedule is pretty... Um, um, it, it's, it's, it's been working. <laughs> We've been doing this, so... It's, I will say this, this calendar, because we need to make sure this is going to be finalized. One thing I will say is once you pick those interview dates, that goes in application, it's advertised, and people put it on their calendar. So we, we say don't plan any birthday parties or weddings or uh, trips, right? Like you have to commit, and we need the entire team there the whole time. Um, because what could happen is if we miss anyone, um, it that real cohesiveness, you all have to be on the same page. Like our goal is that you literally have this unanimous vote of your finalists, right? We don't ever want it to be something where you have like this, this kind of mixture of how you feel because you're starting off already with kind of a tricky, you know, situation. So that's why the process is really uh, strategic. And at the end, we feel you should be very confident with who you select as your finalists. Um, so... With that, uh, yes. Yeah, I, I do want to check in with Miss Laird, see if you yeah. have any thoughts around the. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just thinking about 
kind of what Mr. Clark's saying on time frame and our yeah. job is to hiring yeah. superintendent and things like that. And I mean, we we do have stakeholders that's going to be providing us the input via, you know, the survey and the community meetings and, you know, our two by twos with the cities and different things like that. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if we're adding a layer of redundancy to the process, if we've already kind of gone through some of that process as well, or... It, they're two separate things. So that's more feedback on what to consider as you all think about your new superintendent. Mm -hmm. That input also is helpful. Like there are people who are watching now who are um, interested in the job and them learning from that stakeholder input helps them to do some research. But the, the panel is more about input on the candidates who actually got the interview. So it's a little bit different process. That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would add my two cents. I, I guess I'm in full support of having this the stakeholder committee as part of that interview process. Um, it seems to me like the board would still maintain control of who's hiring or not hiring the superintendent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And, I, you know, I guess I think you guys have done this. We've hired you to run this. You know what you're doing. Um, so I, I would trust your, you know, your ability to schedule all of this. I mean, it's going to be long days. That's that's that. We're not going to get around that. With or without that panel is yeah. going to be a long day. But so I, I, I mean, think I, you have to be okay with that. Yeah, yeah I, I think I personally <laughs> would value you know, hearing from stakeholders what they're noticing or not noticing. Okay. Um, so my two cents would be I would move forward with your suggestions. If we don't have consensus around that tonight and we decide, you know, in, in a few meetings from now that that is something we want, we can always come back. <laughs> you can. What I often suggest is is plan for it, and then if you decide we're not going to do it, that's a little easier than the opposite. If you say we're not going to do it, then you change your mind. There's a process that you that you have to go through, so that's often what I'd recommend. Um, can you um, just, like, review for me really quick on past ad hoc committees, like, uh, mm -hmm. typically how many people are on that committee and yeah. what has the makeup yeah. of that committee been? I think that would also help us to kind of make yeah. a determination. So it varies um, based on who you want to have on your committee. You're a larger district, so typically the larger the district, that number typically gets higher. So I've had, I think the most I've had on a committee was 20 people, and then the least was maybe 12-ish. Um, and it was really more about who is being represented there um, there's some typical, you know, like your union leads, a lot of times you'll have, you'll have parents, maybe community partnerships, but then there may be some additional ones you consider. So we actually have a composition um, framework we give you so that you can see like, hey, how many should be from teachers? How many should be parents? How many should be part of our students? And so we give you that formula and then you all can decide what works for you. And so what that drives is how many questions typically are asked, right? So we try to make sure everyone has at least a question they can ask. So it varies based on what you select. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I I mean, here's the thing. I, I feel like if, if we get community input and we're getting that, but we're still doing our jobs and things like that, you know, I mean, it, it, what's it going to hurt to have that extra level of feedback? You know, I mean, I, I think as long as we're, we're getting the same people that they're talking to or the same people that we're talking to. Absolutely. Um, you know, I don't, yes. you know, it's not like they're filtering anybody out. No, no, so. they, it, yeah, they absolutely do not play a role in that. You select who interviews, <laughs> they are invited to be a part of the process, but they are not, they don't replace you. They actually just add a layer of information for you to consider. But even that, you may decide like, hey, based on the input, <clears throat> We feel it's strong. This person has the most strengths based on the input. And you still may feel like that's not what you agree with. You hire this person because it's your one employee, to your point, uh, Tristy Reed. It's, it's you are the one who is hiring. You're just adding that layer of input, which often boards really appreciate. Um, but if there's, again, <laughs> concerns, things like that, those are things you want to consider. So my suggestion is, honestly, is if you're thinking about doing it, have that as part of the plan, but if you're feeling like, hey, we, we get to that point, this is not going to work, then you take it off and you say, we're not going to do it. But if you say no now, what ends up happening is it'll be really hard to plan that process. So it, it's up to you all. I would say per Ms. Anderson's suggestion there, and, and uh, it's certainly it's important to understand this process, but I, you know, uh, for the sake of time as well, I want to get a sense of if the board, if if that makes sense to move forward with this as the plan and then knowing that we can remove it if we want to. Well, uh, Mr. President, yep. um, how about this? Uh, it, I guess it's a compromise. How about if we, let's say, the the, the candidates that the, uh, the consultants have I helped identify to be interviewed, let's say for argument's sake, there are 10 of them. Mm -hmm. and we block a Saturday and a Sunday. The full board agrees to participate on that Saturday and Sunday. 
we find a location where we have this uh, community uh, panel as well, so we can have multiple rooms. So when the candidate comes in, or the 10 candidates come in to interview with the board, at the same time, in a different room, this community panel is interviewing the exact same candidates. You know, they might, some of the candidates might go to them first and then come to us, or some of the candidates might come to us first and then to them, but it's going on simultaneously. Um, Sounds like that's, yeah, that's and, my understanding of the process. And, yeah. and, um, and then the other thing I might suggest, and is I kind of liked how it worked with this Measure M uh, subcommittee, what about if each board member appoints two individuals to this this committee, and that would include other individuals that, uh, like we had the union leads, would be uh, automatically on this committee? Um, and why don't we create the committee that way? I, I'd be in agreement with that. Ms. Clark. About Ms. Anderson, how, how soon do you need an answer? Yeah, I was going to say, let's take some pressure off of you all. So here's, here's what I'll do is I'm going to forward to you all um, a sample interview schedule so you can see what a couple of those look like, and also the composition. And what we can do based on this calendar, we can actually push that process a little bit further down so you don't feel so much pressure. Um, you can have a little bit more think time on it. Does that sound okay? This, it's not going to determine your process right now, yeah, but I want like you all to feel. I want you yeah. to feel good about this. I don't want you to feel too. Well, too I also bad. really feel like, with as heavy as this is, we really need board member Lofthouse's opinion in on this too. And I would hate to make a really right. major decision. It, too, you know, yeah. if this is going to yeah. be a really major component, I mean, yeah. I'm okay with kind of no, leaving right. it in the schedule for right now. But I would really do it. Like see her feedback on that yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. makes yeah. sense. Okay. That fair. And yep. I would actually like to talk to a few of my colleagues across the state just to, sure. you know, I can CSBA. give you actually some recommendations of folks who have gone through that. So you don't have to do too much, you know, searching around, but folks, you know, mm -hmm. definitely, I think hearing how that felt, I think is important. You want to feel good about this. Sure. So definitely I can share some of the, the searches we've done. <laughs> Um, Dr. DeMarto has some he can share and that way you can at least hear some of the perspective, well, I think, but also uh, your colleagues as well. Uh, in your packet, I believe you there was see a, listed, a yeah. list, so yeah, yeah I'll take well, We can a give look you some that. of the board members so you don't have to go too far looking for them, but absolutely. I want you to feel good about this, okay? Yeah. So for that, let's, it's okay to table it. I'll, f I'll follow up with you all just so you have some more information to consider. Obviously, you have a colleague who's missing tonight, so I think that is important to hear feedback um, as well. And then we can plan for March 7th to revisit this. And then we actually, based on the time frame, we can probably move it down a little further to your next board meeting. Um, it just depends on when you're going to have your interviews because you want to give them enough time to also know when to expect to give up their two days, right? So, okay. So um, if you notice in the calendar, um, again, this timeline is very typical based on when you close the application. So remember March 15th, uh, we're saying, hey, we'll close it. We go through and continue to vet those applications. And then what you see is the third meeting is a longer meeting. You get to hang out with us and we get to show you every single application, every piece of reference that we've gotten. You get to see it all, okay? But to speed up the process, because our job is to do that vetting, okay? You're going to feel like you want to do it. You don't have the time, right? So what we do is we do give you that short list. And that tells you that based on what we are vetting, that these are the top 10, top eight that we recommend you consider. And then you're going to have to then narrow that focus again, okay? So all that happens at that meeting. It's typically five hours. It could go faster. It just depends on how many apply. If I re recall, um, we will be able to see all the applications. Though, Everything. Right? Okay. Everything, yeah. We'll actually confidentially have you also sign the affidavits as well because um, some of this we have sent electronically. We don't like it, but we trust you. And we're going to send it to you because it's so much easier to have. Like we typically send like a Google folder and you get to be able to go through. And then you call us if you have questions. Like literally you get to see it all. So um, you'll have a, a lot of great information, those video interviews. I um, mean, also we'll get to sit with you and we'll go through the whole list of why we thought they were a good candidate or why not. And, and we have contacts throughout. We have contacts throughout the state, so we'll talk to people that are not necessarily on their uh, resume that says, you know, this is my reference. I talk to people in different districts who 
have worked with this individual, but he's not on their list or she's not on their list. So we really do, I think, a good job of venting the candidates so that you know, you're not getting just the references that they want you to have. We're really digging deep into that, talking to people, so. Great. Nicole, um, I just right. wanted to note that the March 28th date would be spring break. So we probably want to, oh, okay. so it'd probably be April 8th, or we want to put a second <laughs> okay. date in there maybe. Sure, so yeah, so I was gonna say, based on the entire schedule, I know you got a chance to look at it. Um, the dates, anything that doesn't work. So the spring break, if that's not um, a good time for you all to me, because it's just you only, closed session. It is doesn't include any staff or anything of that nature. But typically, I know spring break typically applies to the board as well, right? So um, that was one date we came up with. And then also April 11th is another. And so we want to make sure there's enough time between that date and your actual interviews. Right, because we also have some things we have to do in between to get you prepared for that. So, um, based on that feedback, sounds like take the twenty eighth off as an option. If yeah, I would like it, a good idea. Would it make sense uh, maybe tomorrow or Monday to have somebody like Rochelle reach out to the board to set that date so that we can make sure that we've landed on something and have it on the calendar? <laughs> and and Miss yeah. Anderson, you mentioned April eleventh. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, yeah. you know, it's that set in stone. So what I try to do is look at your governance calendar and try to go um, opposite of your board meeting so that you don't get too exhausted. So that's part of the rationale. It's not, it's just a recommendation. Okay. Um, it was, we kind of looked at our dates too of when we're available, but you can pick the date you want. That's that's definitely feasible because well, it doesn't impact anyone except for you all and us. Yeah, let's move forward like that. If, if uh, Rochelle, or if it makes sense to be somebody else following that this one. meeting can reach out to okay. set a date around that. Okay between March 28th or April 11th. It. Okay. it works for you and works for us. We'll, okay. we'll find something this week. Mr. President? Yeah. Um, though that April 19 to 20, uh, the Friday, Saturday, or the 26, 27, is that for those, those are full days, like morning to night? Not quite night. Um, for this like stakeholder <laughs> panel, if that exists, um, typically um, they go home a little earlier. It typically is into the late afternoon. It just, again, it depends on how many applicants, right? So if it's three, versus six, that could look different. Um, for the board, it, it could go into the night based on the deliberations, yeah. Okay, I was just wondering, just because if I need to skip school because it's on a Friday, right? Yeah. The first one would be on Friday, so yeah. I'd be- Yeah, typically, yeah, uh, it's, during the, it's during the morning for sure, too, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, do we have to do a Friday, Saturday? I mean, I don't want kids- You could do Saturday, Sunday. Um, typically, we've done Friday, Saturdays. That's what our typical ones have been, well, but it's up to you. Yeah, I wonder if- because we probably won't land on a date tonight, but if we can have the same process uh, around those weekends, uh, have Rochelle kind of get some sense consensus around the board about what dates work best. Okay. Okay. So then your homework is going to be, you have to do that pretty quickly because one of the things that's going to be neat is all these dates are going to go into the brochure, or the advertisement, um, and you all personally making sure it works for your calendars, talk to your your families, you name it, because it is a commitment, um, which you already commit already um, a lot of time from your families, but yeah. definitely double check. So what we'll do is we'll follow up, give you a little email to say, hey, by this date, get that back to us so we can make sure we got, have this finalized. But um, the time frame in itself is pretty much to get you to a place of having some overlap with your current soup so that there can be some transition time. And then that way, by July 1st, that person is ready to hit the ground running and you're living your best life, right? And uh, so the schedule, for the most part, is in a pretty good space, but uh, we do want to get that as soon as possible. I, okay. I wonder then if, as it's just as a board, we can commit to, you know, by next Tuesday or Wednesday, having... Uh, you know, getting dates sent to us, making sure that we send back all of our, our availability. Okay. So we can, is that early enough if it's by mid next week? I'll put Tuesday and, and okay. Wednesday might be it. Yeah. Tuesday. Because it's so like herding cats. I know you're all Mon busy. Monday, so. Tuesday. <laughs> Monday, Tuesday, as early as we can, as long as okay, it's perfect. Come to perfect. Us and actually, that'll work well because one of the things we need to do tonight, too, is talk about your criteria. And we also are going to have a follow up with you as well to give you language so that you can see here's the draft and you still need to give us some feedback. So maybe we can do both those around that Tuesday, Wednesday deadline. So that, that'll work. Great. Sound fair? Yep. Yeah. All right, good. All right, so um, Sean, I'll follow up with you about the calendar and um, what we'll go into now 
is if you can take a look at, we talked about advertisement. So once um, we start advertising for February 1st through what we're assuming about March 15th or so, so about a, a month and a half, um, there are some advertisement costs that come with that. So we just want to make sure you all are okay with what you've already agreed to. You know the expenses that we talked about in the contract. Um, advertisement varies on based on how much you want to actually advertise in the different venues that are available. So on your packet, you have a copy of the fees that go with typical advertisement. What we placed for you in the um, that schedule was EdCal, which is the AXA newsletter, right? So typically we use that, and typically we do a printed version and the online. So what you see is the fees just tell you what that looks like, okay? So EdCal print for four postings, that's for a month, right? That's $280, right? 30 days online is $350. So you think about those are typical ones. The McPherson website, there's no charge because that's the firm that you hired, so there's no charge for that. Um, EdJoin goes for 60 days typically, so that, that month and a half, um, 60 days they charge 250. EdJoin is the one that um, is, is highly recommended, of course. Um, and then, of course, there's a brochure, which you all got a copy of that at our last presentation. So um, for two pages, it's 250. For four pages, it's, three, it's 500. So when you add all that together, the maximum with just the main ways that we advertise is about $1,600, which is pretty common. Um, you can do less, you can do more. You see some of the things that are available, um, lots of national networks, <coughs> other um, uh, organizations. The great part is we have a network of people. Um, so a lot of times there's no cost because it's kind of embedded into our network. I'm going to Kabe conference, for example. I'll be at CALSA and CASA. Not sure about Soup Symposium yet, but literally wherever I'm present, that is kind of free advertising. It makes sense. There's no extra cost for that, if that makes sense. So you all can decide if you want to do more, but what we've shared with you, those kind of four main pieces, that's what we highly recommend, and it's more than enough. So okay. it's up to you all. So any feedback on that? Yeah, uh, so it, Education Week, it, are you uh, recommending that or not? I don't think it's going to make a huge difference um, because remember, so we're a national search firm. So part of what happens is you're going to get national exposure because of the firm. So when you start adding layers of national print, you know, literally, I don't know if it makes much of a difference because you also are a California based, you know, district. So typically we say really focus on pushing in California, but naturally they're going to get all the hits um, going through the McPherson site alone. So I, I'm, you know, I'm, you know th through, um, my career, I'm very familiar with Education Week and, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, it's it's a very impressive publication. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it does expose the district to a national audience, mm -hmm. um, whereas the the um, entities you mentioned are are California focused. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I I do appreciate the fact that you know you you are a national company and and you do get a um, some national exposure from that. Uh, but for four hundred dollars, yeah. well, I, I guess yeah. my feeling is why not? Yeah, yeah I'm right. fine with that. Right. Yeah, I'm fine with this budget. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm good with the budget uh, okay. as is. So we'll do Ed. We got it. All right. Yeah. All right. Any other spaces you're thinking of including? No, like I said, I think what you have here, I'm I'm good with. If everybody else is. Yeah. And keep in mind, you have your yeah. own website, right? So yeah. you can place that on your site. Anything we share, the brochure, you name it you all can place on your own website as okay. well. So Good. yeah, yep. sounds like we'll move forward then right. with the suggestions. Listed. Excellent. All right. Um, so the next piece would be um, your um, stakeholder um, input groups. So you need to give us some direction on who you want us to get input from based <coughs> on uh, one is I mentioned that there's four questions, right? And these same questions show up on the survey. So what's good about your community? What's good about your schools? What are the issues that the next superintendent should be aware of? And then what are those key criteria attributes that they want to see in the next superintendent? So that's the basis of the questions. It takes about an hour for each session. We do them online. We do them in person. And also there's the survey in multiple language that you decide. So um, if you go back, can we go back to that last uh, document, the calendar? Um, there was a list that we shared. 
And so if you have um, particular people that you'd like us to um, consider, your input tonight is really important, but obviously we'll work with your point of contact to make sure we make that happen. But um, you notice on the list, it's very typical what we put on here. Uh, most of the folks you see, your administrators at the site level, district level, because you're a large district, we typically separate those two groups because they're kind of two different issues. If you go down just a little bit further to that long list right there, there you go. So um, you can see uh, classified staff. So typically we do two because you wanna honor when they're off campus, when they're able to be off campus or not. So sometimes we do an open one and then also we could actually hold one, um, for example, with your leadership. Um, sometimes you can do an AM, a PM version, but those are all the logistical things we could work out. But you can see the list includes really everyone who typically shows up and is partnering with the school district. Um, I've thought about some of your speakers. I call them sometimes affinity groups, right? So making sure you include your Native American, um, uh, I think it was NAPAC. Um, also, of course, your, your student reps. I think we should definitely um, include time for them to give us some input. Um, and so thoughts on that. Yeah, I wonder if we could just ask the board, to, you know, outside of what's on this list, um, and most of these, I think, other than uh, neighboring feeder districts, which would yeah. apply to yeah. us, but outside yeah. of that, um, you know, is there anybody else you would like to add to the list? Otherwise, I think this looks. I, 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 I'd like to see the business community represented. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say chamber, maybe chamber of commerce. Yeah. Okay. Both cities. Yeah. So the chamber. And what we typically do is we try to hold those sessions with um, multiple people. We don't just do one because it will be it'll take too long. So we'll probably have like a business. Uh, community forum and it'll include multiple groups. So it's gonna be important that you let us know. And I'm assuming, Sean, you probably have a good sense of it. It can get the board to make sure we don't forget to invite anybody. I think that's important, uh, but I'll put that on here as well. So the business community. And can we add NAPAC? I know you mentioned it. Yeah, yeah. I have it on my list, but I wanted to make sure that that was um, included. <laughs> Any other affinity groups as well? Um, some have APACs, um, African-American parent advisories. Um, I believe there is an African American advisory okay. group that okay. uh, maybe needs to be added to the list. Okay. Um, okay. Any others? All right. Anything that doesn't apply on here? I know we just have it on our list of neighboring feeder districts, <laughs> but any other ones that may not apply? Like special <coughs> education, we often put that because that's often a group of families who really are, you know, need that sacred time for the issues. So we typically separate it out. Mm -hmm. um, but the list catches pretty much everyone, you think? Yeah, I think so. All right, good. All right, so what I'll do is I'll work with your point of contact. We have a schedule we typically try to come up with, and it, it's a whole process that you all don't want to spend time tonight on. And then, of course, our two student reps, we'd love to make time to meet with both of you to get your input um, as reps as well. That's okay. All right. All right, so lastly, um, what we want to do is talk about your criteria. So this is your important job is to hire your superintendent. So we need to know, get some direction on what that looks like. So hopefully in your homework and prep for this session, you got a chance to look at the sample criteria that we shared. So I try to put as many of the searches that we've been involved in recently, and you can see they're all examples that include a multitude of qualifications. What you see here is a very typical kind of posting, and of course it shows up in a brochure, but you'll see that there are multiple um, ways that you can come up with the five criteria that we use to drive the process. And then we also want to include any preferences or requirements that you have. Okay, so we'll do that after. So what we thought, um, kind of before we go through and ask your input, was there any questions about those particular uh, samples we gave? Is any overarching? No. Okay. And hopefully they were helpful just to give you language. So tonight we're not going to be English teacher. We're not going to wordsmith, okay? Uh, but what we are going to do is get your input on what those, those kind of big categories are. And then we'll follow up with you with some of the language because you got examples. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You may have a few edits you want to make. But we want to get the big piece of what is those five, what are those five criteria. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually ask each of you, um, what are your kind of top uh, qualifications or criteria that you want to see in your next superintendent. Okay, so that's the question to you, the top five. And the way you're going to describe that to me is through one or two words. Okay, so you don't have to give me the full description, but one or two words that just stick out to you of the top five things. Okay, so that's the first question. 
okay? And then when I'm having you narrow that down to one in a moment. So I'm just gonna ask each of you. Uh, Mr. President, note. I'm not sure if the board was informed that this was what we were going to do tonight. I'm wondering if we shouldn't do this on February 1st, especially since a board member Lofthouse is in here as well. Uh, that that might make sense. I wonder if uh, I mean, if the board's okay with that. In order to move the process along, too, um, you know, it, might, it wouldn't be in a public forum, but would it make sense for you to be able to connect with each of us? And then on so, February so we first, could. we can bring that. We could. What's going to happen is going to push your whole timeline back. So we, the idea was you actually advertise by February first. So ideally, and this is pretty typical process, is in our regular session, we typically get feedback from you. And what might be helpful is if you see in the sample criteria anything that really sticks out to you, if you feel more comfortable sharing that, that would be really helpful for us to get the process started. And then we absolutely will reach out also to your absent, your member who's absent to make sure that she gets full input. We'll talk to her on the phone, make sure she hears everything. But it is, for time, it is gonna be really important that we get some feedback from you tonight, at least, at the minimum. So maybe a better question, if you don't feel comfortable with that, is to ask you if there's any sample criteria that really kind of speaks to what you all are really wanting to see in your next superintendent. And that will help us with a little bit with kind of where we can go to get, keep the process going so that you all can stay as best you can in the time frame to start your advertisement and create a draft. This is just a draft, but we need some kind of direction from you tonight, if that makes sense. Mr. President, can we take a 10 minute recess so that we can thoughtfully do this and, and be able to answer the question if we're gonna do this tonight? I'm open to that if the rest of the board is. You wanna share anything? Yeah. yeah. Excuse me for interrupting. Um, I just want to point out one fact that, you know, I've been doing the superintendency for a long time. And March 15th is a very important date. Um, as you may know, you have to notify somebody by March 15th if you're not going to rehire them. What happens is, is the candidates, when they're getting ready to change a job, they'll go early rather than after because they may not want to let their current district know that they're looking for a job. So I just, I just gonna say that just so you understand that you may lose candidates by the further you push this out. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so I think a 10 minute break makes sense. I, I do wanna say I appreciate all those that are, are sticking around who have presentations. So we appreciate that you are staying here late um, and letting us go through this process. So um, if we are back at 9.15, that's seven minutes. Does that feel like enough time for everybody? Let's start with that. If we need a couple more, we'll take a couple more. And, and Mr. Huey, we have a big group here from community schools, so um, maybe we can move them up right after we're done with this process. I know they're um, later on the agenda, but if Mr. Cadenhead's okay with that, we'd like to give them that opportunity to present, to present because I know it's already getting late. Definitely. Well, yeah. another, another solution is that we um, table this item and bring it back in it tonight at a later time, get through the other presentations that the, the community is here for, and then to take our 10 minute break and then come back and talk to the consultants. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, so if there's no objection from the board with that, and uh, uh, McPherson and Jacobson, if you're okay with that, we will table this discussion <laughs> until we get through the rest of our discussion action or discussion items, take a quick break a uh, five to 10 minute break to gather our thoughts, to be able to continue this conversation and then we'll, we'll move forward. It's okay? Okay. So I think what might help with that, instead of tabling this, what we could do, we talked about, we wanted to get your, your feedback on a few things by next week. So what we could do is, is if, since you all have at least gotten the samples, if you feel like you wanna have some time to think more about it, then what we could do is follow up with you individually, get your feedback, and share that draft with you. And then maybe I'll try to see if we can make some adjustments to the timeline, also understanding we don't want to delay it too much. And, and let's see if we can work through that next week uh, with you individually. And then we'll share back like that that draft so you all can give us some final feedback. So it might give it might be a few more days next week, probably towards the end of the week, depending on how fast you all respond. But um, would that help a little bit? So that way you don't have to go back to this tonight. I think that would help. Okay. That you know, since we're throwing out ideas, one last one. Well, we also have two more board meetings this month. Um, yeah. We couldn't we add a 
half hour on or so that we can figure this out. Yeah, I don't know if it's too late to agendize this or if you'd be available for Saturday's board meeting uh, for a half hour, you know, at the end of that board meeting or, or at the beginning of it. Um, so either eight o'clock or two o'clock, if that would work for you. Um, it Even wouldn't work for me. I have okay. a commitment, but um, I feel comfortable with whatever you all want to do. I just want to make sure to his point about we don't want to delay it too far. So um, could we, I mean, you all give, give us direction. Yeah. We kind of are talking Tuesday, Wednesday to get the dates. Could we like take the weekend and mull this over and really like that we commit yeah. that we get this to them by Tuesday? Yeah, I miss Anderson. gives us yeah. that at least amount of time. I mean, I'd. I think if we have the weekend and stuff like that, that's going to yeah. help, I think. As yeah. long as you feel comfortable, that'll give yeah, you Yeah, and if you all want to add that to your agenda and have the discussion, you don't necessarily have to have us here for that, but I think it's important that you have a collective criteria that you all agree on if this is our draft, and then you're <laughs> going to have that stakeholder input where you're then going to go back and do any final updates based on the feedback you've gotten. So I feel okay with that, but I want to make sure, again, that you all feel comfortable with that as well because I know this process... Um, it, it does take a moment and it usually is done in a regular meeting, but I also know you all feel like maybe tonight you don't feel comfortable going through that. So we want to honor that as well. I think that's great. I, I would recommend we add it to Saturday's meeting as a discussion and you guys could watch, uh, oh, mm -hmm. we could, we could, uh, at least come up with that list of the, the five for each of us. Okay. Okay. And if you need further, uh, clarification after that, then we can connect individually. Okay. Okay. All right. Is everybody comfortable okay. with that? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 All right. <coughs> so I'll follow up with you, Sean, to just kind of put some pieces together and just want to thank you all for the opportunity to um, kind of get the ball rolling. And so you know how to reach us, um, just to make sure you know any time in between this process, um, just reach out to us and we'll continue to give you updates based on what you need. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, we look forward to supporting you on the most important decision you'll make is hiring your next superintendent. So right. thank you. And thank you community for your patience yeah. in the process of the superintendent search. Well, we appreciate you being here. Uh, if you can stick around for two seconds, yeah, we yeah. don't have any in-person public comment. Is there any online public comment? Yeah. Okay. In that case, thank you. Okay. We're looking forward to connecting <laughs> again and uh, appreciate all of your work on okay. this. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Okay. That brings us to uh, discussion item B. We'll, uh, well, I don't know if we're moving Did up uh, an item. So item D, community schools update. Thank Ms. you, Hazarian. and I'll welcome uh, Kate Hazarian and Carla Davis. <laughs> Thank you. And welcome to the whole community schools team. We appreciate you being here and all the work that you're doing on behalf of the district. Thank you. And we would really like to thank Mr. Cadenhead for letting us go first. We are greatly appreciative of that. All right. So good evening. Super. Oh, are, we, are we cheering for him? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Good evening, <laughs> Superintendent Kligian, Board President Hui, and members of the board. Uh, we are here this evening to give you and the FCS. The FCUSD community an update on the first semester of the community schools framework implementation in Rancho Cordova. We have several presenters that are here tonight to share the impact of our work so far. We are creating an integrated support system in Rancho Cordova where resources are open to all families in the Rancho Cordova region. Our state has invested over $4 billion in growing community schools in communities that were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Over 60 years of research and evidence shows that a focus on the four community school pillars improves school climate and accelerates improvement in outcome for all scholars in all student groups. A community school is not a grant. It's a commitment to building a whole child whole community approach to learning where we leverage resources to create the conditions for student success. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Carla Davis, Community School Coordinator. And as we transform into community schools, our vision is to create conditions for wellness, student learning, and on-time graduation. We want our schools to be a hub of resources to support our families. We want our staff and families to work together to support the unique needs of each family. A community school has four pillars, integrated student and family supports, sports clinics, connections with families to the food locker, active family engagement, 
helping our families to understand our system and to empower them to be crucial partners in their child's learning. Collaborative, collaborative leadership and decision-making. Families, students, site staff working together to make budget and programmatic decisions. Student-centered teacher and learning practices and expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities. Not necessarily what we're teaching, but really focused on how we're teaching. Connecting our preschool with our day program, our day program with our after school programs, and our year round opportunities. The four values for a community school. Relationships and equity are at the center of everything we do. Power is shared, not based on hierarchy. Classrooms are small, connected communities themselves, and we're always continuing to improve. In May of 2023, um, Folsom Cordova was awarded $7.6 million in grants to Cordova Meadows Elementary, Cordova Villa Elementary, Kinney High School, Mills Middle School, White Rock Elementary, and Williamson Elementary Schools. Those grants are over a five-year period of time. With these funds, we hired either a community school facilitator or a student support specialist on each site to lead the work. We engage in regular PD as a team and also with our SCOE partners. We develop partnerships and um, support with, um, our, sorry, with our community partners to remove barriers to learning and on-time graduation. We've been busy. Our first semester, we have accomplished a great deal. Um, in addition to our site leaders being hired, we also hired gen ed behaviorist attendance specialist, and myself as a coordinator to manage the initiative on the ground level. We partnered with organizations like Superior Sports to create structured recess on school campuses. We've worked with PC Care to offer families in-home parent education and many other things you'll hear about this evening. I wanna highlight our steering committee. This team has worked together for the last year and a half and they've guided this work. Everything from writing job descriptions together to viewing data. Our team has a variety of um, expertise in addition to a partner from um, Sac State and two high school students that are extremely engaged with us. In the upcoming months, we look forward to onboarding two parents and two board members. Thank you. Hello. My name is Stephanie Cecil Spaulding, and I've been a Mills teacher for the past six years, and I'm so excited to be Mills' student support specialist this year and a member of our community schools team. This year is unlike any year I've ever experienced at Mills. There are big welcome changes. There is more support than we've ever had before, but most of all, there is hope and excitement. Tonight, I'd like to share with you how COST, or Coordination of Services Team, is supporting our students. Developing COST at each of our school sites is part of our Community Schools Grant. This year, Mills, Cordova Villa, Williamson, Cordova Meadows, Mitchell, and Navigator have all started to build and hold COST meetings. At Mills, COST meets once a week to determine the next steps in offering support for students who have been referred for attendance, behavior, academic, and or social emotional support. COST has created an intervention library to pair needs with support. Our intervention library includes various behavior academies as part of our ongoing RTI work with the Hannigans, as well as SEL groups that take place during flex time. Now I'm going to turn it over to our community schools facilitator to share additional supports COST provides to our students and families. Buenas noches. <clears throat> My name is Veronica de Alba. I'm the community schools facilitator two, facilitator two at Mills Middle School. I am a resident of Rancho Cordova and a parent, a proud parent of a Cordova High School student and a, a Mitchell Middle School student. I'm short. Let's talk about what the next steps are after a cost meeting. We complete a home visit when necessary. We enroll students in behavior academies 
Sometimes we have to schedule SST meetings or simply reach out to parents. Home visits have been, a cru have been crucial to cost. They take place for a number of reasons, including attendance, behavior, family connections. During a home visit, we build relationships with families, really look into and find those root causes, the whys. Work with families to create plans and connect families to local resources. As we work together, we are having weekly attendance meetings, looking at current data, including our 1.3 attendance increase compared to this time last year, and providing attendance interventions for our students. We have started a check and connect intervention where we support where support staff takes on one to five students. I'm sorry, one to five scholars and checks in with them daily for about two minutes. These scholars are handpicked through data and are part of the manageable attendance list. As a result, attendance has increased in addition to stronger staff student relationships creating a higher level of cooperation and engagement at our schools. Buenas noches. My name is Veronica Pesavento, and I'm the Community School Facilitator at Cordoba Metals. I have the privilege to share with you pillar number two, which is um, active family engagement. We do this with an um, elementary PK group and a my site ELAC meeting. PK stands for Parent Institute of Quality of Education. We partner with this organization to help empower families. In the fall, Cordoba Metals, Cordoba Villa, White Rock, and Williamson Elementary School partner with PK to engage an online eight-week parent class in Spanish. Approximately, we had uh, 80 families participated. You can see the picture of the graduation day on the board. As, as a community school side leaders, we noticed parents have more positive act attitude towards their school. They feel more comfortable asking questions. They have greater confidence to talk with teachers. They encourage other families to help um, fam they encourage families to get engaged and they, they bring more people to get involved in the community schools. Um, 60, 60, 65 families from Cordoba and Kidney High School started Piquet this week. Middle school, uh, Mills Middle School is going to start Piquet next month. Last year, Cordoba Metals, ELAC, and SSC meetings, they were combined. And at the meetings, they average one or two families every month. With the community school approach this year, we have to separate the meetings due to a more significant number of families participating. Now we have 20 families participating in each meeting, and each meeting has been translated in Spanish and Farsi. We are slowly moving to parent participation to parent engagement by engaging in activities for families to give input. ELAC and PK have been two opportunities to engage the family soaring emergent bilingual scholars. And we are so excited to continue building on both of these teams. Thank you. Let's go. All right, y'all. I've been looking forward to this all my life. All right, so uh, my name is Armani, co-founder and CEO of Project Optimism Incorporated. I am so proud of you two, Matthew, Van, y'all the truth. I wasn't nothing like y'all on y'all level when I was y'all age, for real, for real. I see y'all. And, and yeah, we'll talk later. Okay. All right, so uh, I told myself, I put a note, note to self, a minute and eight, uh, 80, uh, 58 seconds, self-talk. Okay, let's get this. First things first, uh, I want to make y'all day because um, I'm always letting our scholars know that I'm representing them wherever I'm at, right? And so uh, even though I had them say the wrong thing, I thought it would be nice to do something like this. So y'all won't be able to see the video, but y'all can listen to it. Check it out. Listen up. Oh, I got to turn. I got to start it over. Hold on. 
This is them talking to y'all, by the way. Three. So they said board of directors, but it should have said board of education, but they wanted to say hello. And one of the biggest things I want y'all to know um, in a lot of ways is I need them to know that their impact is uh, far greater uh, than just the space that they're in. If it's their environment, if it's their school, I'm taking them to the district office. We're taking them in our partnerships with the Sacramento Kings, whatever you could think of. And so I think, I think it's important to make sure that they get that love and get that notoriety because I hope that they are in chairs like you guys one day because currently they're in elementary school. Uh, and the two schools that we're at is Cordova Villa and Cordova Meadows. And it's been a blessing. And uh, I just want to give kudos to your team, uh, well, to uh, your extension of you because I really feel like y'all got it right. And the reason why is because we're a grassroots organization and we need the stability, the st stability to really, really make a change. And y'all know how things work. It takes years to really get to a point where you're established, right? And yes, we're, we're going on eight years. We're doing great work in multiple districts, not just in Sacramento, but in LA as well. But we knew that our pivot to another district in Sacramento was important. And so we was interviewing districts as well, if you will, to figure out what would be a great partnership. And with community schools, it really gave us a, a place to really lay our head and feel comfortable. And so this first year has been about building relationships, not just with our scholars, but with the community, with the, with the, with the, with the leadership, with teachers, and so on and so forth. And so one of the things we, we want to highlight and let y'all know, because on the far, well, actually two pictures, the left side and then the middle picture, something that we do every year, and we did it at all 14 schools that we were at, it's called the power of giving. And what we love about our Power of Giving event is they do receive a gift, right? But that's not the best part. The best part is they get a chance to be a blessing to someone else. Because we want to keep on having our young scholars be leaders in their community. And so for them to be a blessing to other people, we want to cultivate that for the rest of their life of being civically engaged and looking back and giving back for the rest of their life. And we tell them all the time, we can't give to all of Sacramento, but we can empower you to give back. And it's a ripple effect. And that's just one of the successes, the many successes that we get to do every single day. And I still didn't write off my notes. So I'm about to read these last little parts and I'll be done. I'll be out your hair. Sorry, sorry, Kate. Sorry, Kate. Um, so from our program coordinators, Janine and Kim, who's doing an amazing job, they just want to let you all know that we have full houses. That means it's a lot of fun, a lot of play, uh, and it's, it, it can be really loud. Uh, but we have full houses. We actually have a waiting list because that's how engaged and that's how excited young people are to step through those Project Optimism doors. And so whenever you see an O from a scholar, please give it back to them because that's their way of greeting each other and letting them know that they're uh, with a fellow leader. Um, as well as just knowing that we've made exceptions for sibling sets, uh, even going down to third grade because normally we work with fourth grade all the way up to middle school. Um, and that's been a success as well. And then I think the last thing I would like to let y'all know is we did a satisfactory um, survey recently where we're talking about the sense of belonging, trust, uh, trusting the adults around them, especially the mentors that, that serve them. Uh, and that was a really, really good response. And for me, I like to end by saying mentorship has saved my life. And the reason why I say that, and it's, it's, it's not the popular one where I had mentors that was pouring into me. No, when I was... 20, 21 years old, I became a mentor. And I'm 34 years old now, don't, be, don't do me like that. But I'm 34 years, uh, 34 year old, four years, oh my goodness, I'm 34 years old now. Now, and being a mentor saved my life because the accountability that comes with being a mentor, y'all. And for our young people, and when I say young people, I'm talking about our staff, college students and young professionals on their journey, I tell them that you're coming in because you want to make a difference. But you'll slow down and realize that these young people are actually making more of an impact on you uh, than you can ever make on them right away because you're just planting seeds. And so I want to end that way because I thought it was important. Uh, and, and then the last thing I want y'all to get is actually a lesson from a young person. And I want y'all to hear him loud and clearly because this was the message of the day. And then I'll be out. All right, so I got my little bro, my little mentee glasses on, and he got my glasses on, Project Optimism exclusives, and uh, he got a message for y'all for today. What's the message? Taser, to be, to be successful, you got to keep on moving up. To be successful, you got to keep on moving up. Let's go. Championship, where the O at? And the reason why he said that is because one, one of our mentors had to... Uh, 
he had to get a full-time job. He, he wasn't able to sustain a part-time job, which that's all we could offer to our mentors currently. And uh, he was very sad. And I wanted to remind him that we want to support our mentors too. So like when he found out that he had a full-time job, I said, we're happy for him, right? We want him to keep on elevating, right? He was like, yeah. He was like, dang. He said, okay, that's good. He said, to be successful, you got to keep on moving up. And so I challenge us all to do that for the rest of our life. All right. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm done. Good evening, y'all. I'm here. We're here to uh, representing Williamson Elementary, a community school. Good evening. My my name is Karina Pimentel, and I have been a Rancho Cordova resident for 15 years. I still remember the struggle of being a new new to the city and not knowing how to access services for my children and family. I have four children who all attended Williamson Elementary, and I have a very deep connection to the Rancho Cordova community. As an admin assistant to Williamson Elementary School, I understand the struggle families are facing. Before we had a focus on becoming a community school, we shared with families the district resource flyer, yet there were still families' needs that were not being met. Now that we are working toward becoming a community school, we are able to better, con I'm sorry, I'm very nervous, <laughs> better connect families with resources, not only in our school, but out in the community to remove the barriers to students' learning. Having a community school fa facilitator helping to lead the work and shift our thinking, we now have access to snacks through local partnership and also bring food to the schools such as strawberries and prepared meals. More than ever, I see the relationships deepening between our parents, our school, our school staff. Our parent participation has increased for events, classes, and meetings. Um, reassuring that parents want, want to be part of the school but didn't know how. I see the sense of pride in the parents, and I am thankful for our community school journey. Thank you. So in reflecting on the start of our community school journey, I wanted to share a few things that we've learned. Transformation takes a team, not just at our school site, but a team across the city of Rancho Cordova, teaming with our partners, We've learned that the best way to support needs is to build on strengths. Community schools are a mindset, and it's about shifting our thinking to do school differently. We've also learned that diversity in language and ethnicity really matters to our families. And the importance of filling the gaps for families to have access to services, including physical health. Our goal is to impact our student learning, attendance, and graduation through support and relationships. Our current community schools have a 2.63% attendance increase this past semester, which was 1.21% higher than similar schools that do not have community school support. In addition to the supports from our front office, from our teachers, from our support staff, our administrators, our community school team has had an additional 193 home visits, an additional 747 one-to-one -one formal student connections, an additional 1,691 additional attendance phone calls, mm -hmm. and an additional 763 family connections about resources and support. We have a new partnership we're excited to share about on the horizon, and we're proud to share about a mobile health clinic that will be coming to Rancho Cordova with our UC Davis partners. The mobile clinic will be located for now, just one day a week, but we're gonna grow on the CLC campus. It'll support general health and behavioral assessment for children ages zero to 18. We're currently working on the MOU and we're ironing out the details to bring this support to Rancho Cordova starting late February, early March. All right, so here are the remaining schools eligible to apply for community schools implementation grants. 
Schools are eligible to apply for funding if they are at least 50% unduplicated, with the state prioritizing schools that are over 80% unduplicated. Carla has been working closely with site teams on their needs and strengths assessment, which informs each school's implementation plan. There will be common features in each community school in order to make sure we're creating an integrated system of care throughout all 18 schools in Rancho Cordova. We will submit this grant application by February 9th, hopefully a little sooner than that. And yes, we are tired um, for $9.5 million for these schools over the next five years. We'll know which schools are selected in late April, early May. All right, so we wanna really um, thank Superintendent Cleegan, whose vision helped us get where we are so far. And in our first semester, we are really thrilled with the impact we're seeing. We wanna thank our labor partners who also serve on our steering committee and to you, to our board, for embracing the vision of community schools throughout Folsom Cordova. We know that transforming our schools into the centers of wellness within their communities is a team project. This is challenging and rewarding work. The new community partners, um, the new community partners we've brought on, like Project Optimism, our student support specialists, our community school facilitators, our behavior specialists, and our operation graduation attendance specialists that we've hired through the grant are change makers on their campus. And we have all of them, all of our student support specialists. You guys better put your cameras away. Uh, student support specialists and community school facilitators here from our cohort one schools. We just like them to stand for a moment so we can acknowledge their hard work. Thank you. And we have several members of our steering committee here too, if you'd like to stand. <coughs> Thank you, thank you guys. So we are building on the strengths of our scholars, our staff, our families and community partners. None of the great work you have heard about uh, tonight was done in isolation. This is teamwork each and every day. We are very excited about what the future holds for our Rancho Cordova schools. Thank you again for the opportunity to present and we're here to answer any questions. Great. Thank you guys so much. Uh, bring out the questions or, or comments from the yes, board. Mr. President. Yeah, Mr. President. Um, you guys are amazing. And when I'm out visiting schools, I see the work that you put in. I mean, I thank you. And we should be standing, giving you guys uh, a standing ovation. Um, Armani, you know I love you, man. And I appreciate everything that you do uh, mentoring these kids. You and I actually share that same vision of looking at those kids and encouraging them and, you know, kind of developing them along the way as they grow to be leaders in their own right. And you're right to come back and maybe sit on the dais or be that city council meet, uh, member or a city planner or taking a leadership role within their community. That's one thing that we should always instill. I, I instill that with my mentees and just tell them, hey, you can, you can do this. You got this, it's, you know, so I appreciate what you do in Project Optimism. And I, I tell you, uh, we at the Greater Sacramento Urban League has heard a lot about you. And we probably will start partnering with you soon. So just keep that in mind. But I'll be in touch with you about that. But I just appreciate the work you do. And, and ladies, again, you guys are phenomenal. And when we did the last Parent Summit, you guys did that. So thank you for everything. Appreciate all of you. I did have one question. Um, and I think Ms. Veronica brought it up about the um, partnerships that you have and the home visitation. Do you find yourself duplicating services from other organizations that are in the community? I don't. I think we're partnering very well. OK, good, because I mean, you're not kind of like recreating any other programs that you're doing. I mean, one organization may have one thing going on and you all may have another thing going on, right? We're the connector. OK. OK. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Clark. Any others? Yeah. I just want to say great presentation. I liked all the seeing all the students uh, like, you know, be happy and in their moment. 
Um, and I especially appreciated, you know, my sister goes to Cordova Meadows and knowing that she could be on this dais one day because of mentorship that you guys do, that's, that's a good feeling. I, I, I got a lot of serotonin from that. And yeah, I just wanted, I just wanted to share that. Thanks, Ms. Brown. Ms. Leary. Um, yeah, I mean, your progress in one semester is remarkable. I mean, um, starting a new program is very labor intensive and just your immediate reaction once you got that grant and just started going and making those connections within the community. Um, and I know that our community partners also appreciate finally that connectivity into our district, you know, um, because it's like we, we've had these partners and we've struggled with how do we connect them to our families and things like that. And so being that connective piece, um, one thing that just re really resonated with me was how every single time the students were referred to scholars. And I think that just continually like just empowers them that they are excellent. And that is just like such a word of excellence. And, you know, we, we treat them that way from get go. And I just really like that you do that. And just really the other thing I appreciate is just the family connectivity to it, that the families can be involved in the progression of their students. And um, I think just being able to have that connectivity within your schools um, to feel like as a parent, because sometimes as a parent you go and you're like, I want to help, but I don't know where, I don't know how, um, and to, somebody, to be able to have someone on site that can help to um, direct you to how that can be accomplished and really how to connect within those services as well. So thank you guys so much for your work. I'm like always so excited to hear about community schools and all the work that you're doing, and you guys are doing an amazing job. So thank you so much. Ms. Reed? Yeah, uh, ditto to what, what everyone has indicated. You know, I was really excited when uh, th this concept of doing community schools was presented to the board uh, last year. Um, and, you know, I admittedly didn't know a whole bunch about it. I did a lot of research back then, you know, what, what exactly is all this? And, and actually had presentations as well. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the community school model is something that I guess I would challenge staff. Let's find a way that every school in FCUSD is a community school, regardless of, wh of whether we can find grant money to support it or not. There are concepts in community school that we don't need grant money to incorporate. Um, you know, certainly um, we should grab the grant money when we can, right, to help uh, uh, have a more robust community school model. But you know why not uh, find ways uh, for the schools that you know, we may not qualify for community grants to find ways to incorporate uh, the, that type of model into it so that we can be proud to say um, each one of our 36 schools in FCOSD uh, operates on a community school model. So, uh, but keep up the good work. I, um, I'm eager to see uh, the statistics and, and the success uh, at the completion of the, the, of the full first year. So, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Reed. Uh, well, I, I, will, I will say this. I we know we didn't get to it when we were talking about the superintendent search, but one of the things listed on my criteria is community schools. Uh, so, so, so grateful for the work that you guys are all doing. Um, it's making a huge impact. You know, as Ms. Lair mentioned, we're, we're seeing that already in the semester who knows what we're gonna see in two or three years. So I uh, can't tell you how grateful we are. I know you thank the board for the support, but I feel like mostly we just get to stand up here and say, thank you guys for doing all this work. You're the ones who are doing everything. Um, so we're really grateful for that. Uh, it's been a long night. Armani, thanks for bringing some energy. Uh, <laughs> this is very helpful. Does my heart a lot of good to see you tonight. Uh, so thanks for your work. I hope we can get you into more than two schools soon. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've seen a lot of programs, but, uh, you know, Project Optimism is unlike any other. Uh, so thank you for the work you're doing. Um, and not to throw a wet blanket on that, but my, you know, my big concern is this is we've got 10 and a half staff hired. We do have a lot of money till 2028. Um, but I, I am curious, it doesn't necessarily have to be answered tonight, and I'm sure you're thinking about it too. Um, what does sustainability look like this? Um, because I know you mentioned this isn't a grant. I think maybe it's more of a, uh, you know, initiative grant more than a sustainable grant. So um, that's my concern is how do we make sure that we are able to continue funding this, continue funding these staff? I know that the state's coming out with some solutions to that, hopefully, that make this more sustainable. But if you have a comment tonight, great. If not, just know 
uh, I know I'm thinking about that. I'm sure you are um, as well. But uh, otherwise, we're so happy with what you're doing. Mr. President, if I may, I, I will tell you that uh, CSBA will be uh, doing legislative action day. And one of the things that we will be pushing for is more funding for our community schools to make it sustainable in the years to come. So I just wanted to let you know that you. we are behind you on that. Thank you. Thank you. I think CTA, too, is a big partner in pushing for, for the work. So um, sustainability is going to be through how we use our supplemental dollars and also other funding streams that are coming. There's equity multiplier grants that are going to be coming that I think can help support the work. The thought is, is the, these are five-year grants with the possibility of a two-year extension. Um, so that gives us some time to build it in. We're asking all of our schools in Rancho Cordova to include community schools language in their SIPSA applications or um, SIPSA documents. And then also I've whispered in Superintendent Cleegan's ear, we, we have an education foundation that is um, dormant right now, but could we restart that and have that be another vehicle for doing some grant writing and seeking some funding? And then Medi-Cal reimbursement uh, is changing a lot in California and the things that we can uh, bill for. So Carrie and I and others are working on um, looking at that as another funding stream. But the goal is to braid funding together because we don't ever want to be dependent on only one funding source for great programs. Uh, are, right now, are we relying on other grants for the, the staff that are currently working within community schools? So two of our student support specialists now are funded through supplemental dollars, centrally uh, managed supplemental dollars. Carla's uh, salary, 40%, is paid for through supplemental, so we're already braiding some of that funding okay. in. Yeah, good. All right, well, I, yeah, I know I'm confident you will all figure it out uh, and appreciate you keeping us updated on that as, as you do. Um, but thank you all, again, for your work and for staying here late tonight. Uh, I'm sure everybody's had a long day. So. Uh, thank you. We're gonna, there's no public comments in, in person. Are there any online? Okay. I have one yes, more uh, comment. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Um, Once again, I just wanna echo the thanks that this board has for this great program. From the bottom of my heart, I can't really express how much gratitude that I have that I'm able to be in a district that has this kind of support for the community. One more shout out to Armani. Thank you for bringing the energy. Um, it's been a really long week for me and probably for everyone else here. Um, but I really appreciated the student interaction that you showed. Perhaps we could collaborate together with the Student Advisory Board. It would be really <laughs> great if we could get a partnership, bring them in, talk to the kids, um, get some mentors and mentees out, out to the SAB because I think that's a really great opportunity that we could have to elevate these really young leaders. But yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Melger. Uh Great, well, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I hope you guys all get a lot of rest the rest of the night. Okay, Mr. Cade has been so patient. Uh, brings us to item B, Folsom High Zero Period Course Offerings. Welcome, Mr. Cadenhead. Thank you again for your yeah. flexibility. And oh, happy to. It was great to see the presentation. I'm glad I was able to. Um, so I, I want to say thank you, Dr. Kligian and board members for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the um, Bell schedule and the opportunities that we provide students at Folsom High School academically um, and give you a little bit of background on sort of the process that we've been through in the past to examine our Bell schedule and those opportunities where we are currently and, and certainly sort of our vision for where we're headed. But um, I do want to start a little bit that um, if we move to the next slide, we, in 2018 or so, we went through about a six to eight month process to really examine our board, our, our bell schedule. Oh, thank you. There we go. Uh, to examine our bell schedule and make sure that the opportunities we provided students really reflected their need at the time, right? Um, because obviously we have three different bell schedules in our district. And, and again, um, there are a lot of needs at a, at a high school our size, a diverse set of needs. So this, this process that we went to included board members, uh, Dr. Kaligian, I know at the time, Daniel Thigpen, maybe Mr. Clark, um, teachers classified, uh, site admin, et cetera. So there was a large group of people over the course of the time um, that we did this large group of stakeholders. And it really, again, was the better part of an entire school year. We hired a data analytics firm, Forecast 5, 
to really look at schools around uh, California to give us a presentation on the different styles of Bell schedules and really to take a look at like schools, demographics, achievement, um, socioeconomics, but just take a look at a multitude of Bell schedules and try to correlate a Bell schedule with achievement and opportunity, right? And data, whether that's behavior, um, state testing, APs, all that kind of thing. So I included when you have your own time, you have an opportunity to kind of take a look at the data that was presented to us and a look at many of the models of Bell schedules. And there were many <laughs> that we considered at, at that point in time. Um, so we surveyed parents, staff, and students pretty extensively, and we still have the survey results. And just in short, what we learned, which I'll be honest, was a little bit of a surprise to me at the time, um, there wasn't any correlation we could find between a bell, bell schedule and achievement for students. Um, our staff in particular at Folsom High School felt strongly about seeing their students four times every week. That was sort of a core value of theirs that they wanted to look for in this search. Um, families overall and pretty overwhelmingly did not want a block schedule. They really favored the traditional schedule. Um, they liked the idea of having a choice in our community, by the way, of a block schedule and a traditional schedule for kids if it ever presented itself where students could make that those choices. Um, and they really overwhelmingly liked the idea of having a six period day, but they did want to increase the access to zero period courses and access to other courses and opportunities at time. And a big reason for that, I think, just to give context as well is that, um, you know, uh, CTE pathways, obviously, and other pathways that sometimes go unnoticed, like um, student government is typically a four year pathway for kids, right? Um, and other classes like advanced conditioning and football and, and a variety of other things. Um, so a little bit has changed since that time. Uh, really the ask coming out of that process was, can we start school a half hour later in 2018? Can we start school a half hour later and start at 8.30 instead of um, eight o'clock? Because our, at the time, our zero period class started at 7 a.m., which was early for the adults, early for the kids. And so that was the question. It was difficult to make that switch at the time, um, but obviously since then the state law has changed and here we are, right? Uh, we do now also, uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Ogden, Dr. Kaligian and board members, we have an allocation of FTE that we can provide more extensive zero period offerings based upon demand uh, when it's there. And that's two FTE or really uh, 10 periods of zero period courses that we can offer that were provided that opportunity. Um, prior to 2022, really, we have offered eight periods of zero period, typically. Um, and in recent years, we're up to about 12. It's important to understand that we offer any zero period that students want. So it is really based upon their requests. Uh, so they indicate their desire for zero period in their course selection process when they choose their courses and meet with their counselors. Um, and again, this year we were able to fill 12 based upon those student requests. Sometimes there will be about 10 students or so who wanted to get into a zero um, that wasn't provided or there was some other zero they chose to take and there was a conflict, so they didn't get in. But there's not a large number of students that are clamoring for a zero period at this point in time that we're not offering. Um, if they want to take a zero period at Folsom High School, they can start at 7.30 and get done at 2.30 in the afternoon. And if I'm being honest, I thought a lot more kids were going to do that. <laughs> but they're not, which is interesting. I thought, well, they may want to be out early. And in talking to our students, many of them are saying, listen, there are obligations at 3.30, sports and otherwise, that we kind of need to be here for or want to be here for anyway, clubs, all that sort of thing. So leaving at 2.30, we'd probably just be back at 3.30. So... A lot of them have not chosen to do that. This year, to give you an idea, we offer US history, biology, IM3, uh, fitness two, chemistry, chamber choir, world culture, Spanish three, econ gov, pre-cal, uh, health and concert band. We also, one of those classes, we build in an IM3 for our eighth grade students as well to serve our eighth grade students from the middles. Um, one of the things we have talked about is how we make sure that we increase uh, awareness and promotion of that opportunity for students. 
uh, through social media, direct contact with them in their counselor meetings, because every student uh, meets with a counselor to, to talk about their schedule and to modify their four-year plan on an annual basis. Um, but uh, newsletters and uh, so on, just to make sure, again, that everybody's aware that they have that opportunity. There are also additional opportunities that have come up since that point in time, and the educational landscape, as you well know, is shifting. And so uh, we do have on campus advanced, or excuse me, in the communities, advanced education opened up to pretty much all students, right? So uh, many of our students are taking advan advantage of advanced ed and going to community college classes. Um, we have on-campus dual enrollment now with Folsom Lake College that is kind of an, in its infancy, but everybody that I have talked to have stated they appreciate it. I see it growing. It's a great opportunity for our kids to earn high school credit and community college credit. And they are getting um, six Folsom Lake College credits um, in, in their time with us. And I think it's actually 20 elective credits over the course of this, or 10 credits over the course of one year. I'm sorry, it says 20, should say 10. And we also offer during the school day credit recovery to students. So we do have two teachers, a math and science credentialed and an English social science credentialed teacher. So if students need to recover credits at a more rapid pace, they can do that at the end of their day, six period. And when they're done and they're recovered, they have six period open. So there's incentive around that as well. It's been pretty popular. It's a great opportunity. Serves kids also who don't necessarily want to attend summer school or, or recover those credits in other ways. Um, we also see a lot of students who really like to see flexibility in their educational opportunities and their day, who are looking at opportunities through Silicon Valley, UC Scout, National you know, University, Virtual High School, BYU Online. There's kind of a proliferation of A through G and NCAA qualified opportunities through distance learning. And UC Scout's a very popular one, being um, created by the UC system and adds a lot of weight and credibility to the AP classes that they offer online. So students have liked that flexibility as well. They can take those courses on their schedule, right, and augment their current transcript. So those are all new opportunities that we're seeing for our kids. So um, a lot going on and, and I see it continuing to shift. And I think one overall theme that we continue to hear from students is they appreciate flexibility. And that's something that we're talking a lot about in our policies and conversations with kids, whether it's having an open period, having other ways they're getting certain classes. We do require all students to have four periods, right? So that we maintain that FTE, which makes sense. But it also sometimes, if they are not on campus for a period, addresses some of our crowding issues and alleviates some of those issues. So it's actually sometimes a positive for students and a positive for us um, if they have an open period or two. We collect all that FTE, they have ed educational opportunities they're meeting, and they're not necessarily taking that seat so we can fill those classes. So questions? Ms. Reed. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Principal Kinhead, for this presentation. Um, you know, th this was actually at, at my request that this uh, be added to the agenda. And I have to admit that my thought on this matter has evolved over time. Um, and the most recent evolution in my thought actually was when I came and chatted with you about, about uh, this, uh, uh, what, I guess, a month or two ago. Um, you know, originally when I asked for this be added to the agenda, it was more the block schedule. I asked, can we have a conversation why Folsom High is not on the block schedule? Uh, and, and part of that, honestly, is um, perhaps VISTA does too good of a job of marketing their block schedule because all we ever hear is how great the VISTA schedule is uh, and how their students are more prepared for a college than any other students in the district because they have the block schedule and it mirrors the college education and this and that. And, and you know, it's a small community and, and parents hear that. And one of the questions that I've been asked probably more than any other in the last four or five years by Folsom High parents is how come we don't have the block schedule? Yeah, we're hearing how great it is at Vista, and we and we don't even have the opportunity of choice in the Vista uh, uh, because they're overcrowded. Um, so it's it's basically you know we're dangling you know how great this the schedule is, but yet we don't have access to it. Um, and you know I, I think part of it, and you you answered a lot of those 
questions tonight in your presentation. But I think part of it is, you know, the six period all right, is, it has been successful. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, originally the disparity was, was fairly obvious in that VISTA students, I forget the exact credits, but how many credits they graduate with. And then Cordova High has a seven period and how many credits they graduate with. And then you have Folsom High at six credits and, or six periods, and they have far less credits than both Cordova High and, uh, and VISTA. Now, arguably the zero period could fill that. And, you know, based on our conversation, you know, that's when I, I indicated to the superintendent, you know what, change the topic from block schedule to zero period. Because I actually think that's the focus that perhaps, you know, I'd like to, you know, you know hear more about, which, which you discussed tonight. Um, you know, and, you know, whether there's an opportunity to, maybe we, maybe we just need to promote the zero period more to say, you know, maybe there needs to be more, um, uh, you know, marketing material, both um, a tactile as well as social media uh, and electronic that, you know, educates not only the students, but the parents of, you know, some, some benefits of zero period in considering zero period. Um, you know, the number of credits you could, you could hypothetically graduate if you wanted to max out uh, and say, you know, you could graduate with this number of credits if you take zero period all four years. Um, or, um, you know, this is the number of additional classes you can take. I mean, one of the things that we have, uh, you know, clearly is the state legislature loves to keep on adding a mandatory requirements, uh, mandatory classes. You know, we're going to be having the, the ethnic studies is a mandatory class. Each time they add a mandatory class, it reduces the amount of electives that students can take. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that is one way we can, you know, market it, say, listen, you know, uh, with additional mandatory classes uh, dictated by the, the, the state, you know, and, and, you know, if you want to take or, ma or maximize the number of electives you, you want to participate in, the best way you can do that is take a zero period. Um, uh, and, I, and, and then kind of reiterate some of the, the talking points that you did in the slide tonight, indicating that there's, there, you know, there's no difference. Uh, we're not seeing any difference on opportunities. We're not seeing any difference in, in success levels or, or, or the like. To try to, to educate our community that, hey, the sixth period is great for Folsom High School. Vista, you know, okay, they like the block schedule. That's great for Vista. Seven periods working for, uh, for Cordova High, that's great. But, you know, at least to say, you know, we can, you basically can graduate with similar amount of credits as both, uh, well, equal amount uh, as Cordova High if you take the zero period and, and somewhat close to what you have at Vista if you take the zero period. Um, you know, I just think a lot of students don't think about it. And now I completely understand when this was first launched in 2018, you know, you know, 7 a.m. is pretty early, right? Um, I think that it's a big difference when we went from 7 a.m. to 7.30. I think it became much more reasonable potentially for students to say, oh, I could, I could do that. Um, and, you know, I, I think that perhaps we just haven't really, you know, done a, a full court press in, in um, you know, making it exciting. Like this is an exciting opportunity for you rather than, you know, you have to drag yourself out of bed and go to school earlier. Um, you know, and I think if we could, if we could build that excitement, that education, that knowledge about the great resources and opportunities you could uh, pretend, potentially do, you're going to see a, a market uh, in uh, improvement in the number of students who are going to say hey, to their counselor, I want to take zero period. Um, so I, I ultimately have decided that, you know, I, I agree with you and, based, and thank you for your, your <laughs> sage advice. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think the solution isn't necessarily switching Folsom High to block. It's, it's how can we better market and expand the zero period and the offerings. I mean, yeah, I mean, you have 12 offerings that, and that's great. But, um, you know, how many classes or different types of classes does Folsom High have? I, I have to imagine it's in the hundreds. Um, so 12 is just scratching the surface. How many classrooms do you have at, you know, on campus? 12 classrooms is just scratching the surface. Um, and, I, and I do think, and I'm happy, I was going to ask a question, but you, you, have, you, um, you brought it up in the final slide. You know, I was going to ask you, you know, could the zero period be part of the magical cure in dealing with overcrowding, at least 
in a short period of time, and, and you said it, you know, indicated that it, it, it could be. Um, uh, you know, and that's, and that's going to be a problem. Whether we like it or not, you know, we'd like to get this fourth high school built as soon as possible, but in reality, it's not going to just spring up overnight. It's going to be a number of years from now. Um, so we're going to have to deal with, with you know, pressures uh, with population. And if, if, um, if zero period can provide um, opportunity to lessen that overcrowding, I think that's something we should take care of or take, take seriously. So um, that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Mr. President. Any other questions or comments from the board? Sorry. Um, not not so much. Um, more of a comment. Um, and as much as I love the zero period, um, honestly, for me, the dual enrollment maybe seemed like maybe a little bit more of the future of where we're looking. Um, you know, I think kids want to graduate with a certain number of credits, but I think really what they're looking for is how much am I jump starting my life and my career possibilities by getting that dual enrollment. So I think as much as we can continue to like work through our CTE partners and things like that of really getting those dual enrollment credits, I think besides just getting up a little earlier and having an extra class, but getting that, you know, and being able to come out and say, hey, I'm already a semester or a year ahead in college might even be the more desirable route to go for them just because they have, you know, increased that time. I mean, people who are looking at master's programs and things like that, you're, you're moving those time frames all up. And, you know, especially with Folsom Lake College being in such close proximity and the offerings that they have and things like that, I think, you know, um, I think we have opportunity with partnership there to continue that too, so. I, I would echo that. I would say that our students um, don't necessarily spend their time concerned about high school credits um, because more or fewer credits really doesn't impact them. Uh, they have to get the 220 at all three of our schools, right, in order to graduate. What they're looking for is opportunities um, to put AP classes potentially, right, or complete a pathway because if they pass the AP and they pass the test, they could potentially earn college credit for that, right? So it's helping them in subsequent years. I agree completely on the dual enrollment. But I also think a priority for our kids is opportunities through CTE pathways. You go back to that. I, I definitely think they would like to finish those, earn certifications and opportunities through those programs, if not just explore potential career pathways, right? So I, 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 I think that um, also kind of going back a little bit, and I appreciate that reflection, uh, Mr. Reed, but I also think that it's just sometimes a preference between depth and breadth sometimes, between block. I love block. I've come to love our schedule. <laughs> there are positives and negatives to all of them. My concern, and I think our concern, is always meeting the needs of our kids. Do you have enough opportunity to be competitive? And I would also argue, when we look at the uh, acceptance rates of our kids, it's pretty impressive. They're getting into places they want to get to largely. Well. Um, I also think that also to getting to a capacity where we do have choice again to where we can move, you know, for families who do want the block or families who do want the six, that really increase in the capacity when we get to that point, I think will allow that flexibility for the for the families who really want to go there, right. you know, and it's like we just really haven't had that because of a capacity issue, but, you know, hopefully we can get that resolved and move forward in the next few years so that that like ability to be able to go back and forth, because really what we want and we're talking about is for families to have choice and, you know. And I would, I would echo that when we look at school choice from Vista, I look at them from Vista to Folsom and Folsom to Vista. What I hear most of the time is just, we really like the block schedule or we don't like the block schedule, it's too fast. I hear both. And I've heard all of that for many years. So I, it, it's often preference. Mr. Uh, President, I do have a, a question. I, I, I guess I rattled on without a question. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Uh, I see on the zero period, I don't see any AP classes. Is, is there a reason why we don't have AP classes at zero period? Um, not necessarily. It just hasn't so much been requested. Um, a lot of times I think that the classes that we see, I'm not looking at it right now, um, on that list um, allows kids to take, let's say, econ, gov, zero period, right? Allows seniors to fit more APs into the core of their schedule. Um, similar with IM3, similar with pre-calculus, et cetera, or similar with concert band or band or some of these other offerings, being in zero period allows them to take the APs over the course of their regular day. They just haven't requested the APs early for whatever reason. A lot of that maybe is sometimes there are limitations. We maybe have, a, you know, 
a calculus teacher who, you know, just can't be present for zero period, and that will help drive some of the other things as they fall in place to serve that. And are any of these classes on the CTE pathway? Is, I guess, chemistry? Uh, um, I'm looking not necessarily CTE. Yeah. So it may, maybe, again, another opportunity to... And, and any of them placed in zero really frees up the rest of their right. day. I think what we do see, we don't have a lot of freshman classes in zero period either, I'll be honest about that. Concert band, I am three, um, Spanish three at times, but you, you don't see chamber choir, but you don't see a lot of freshman classes. But regardless, I think the overall scope of those zero periods do represent four years, allowing students to take this class zero period and open up to take an AP somewhere else in their day. Good. I, the only question I have there is uh, if, you know, have we ever done any look at if, if there's any correlation between students who are taking a zero period and then the grades at the end of the day dropping after they've been in school an extra hour? Um, no, we haven't actually. That's a great question. I mean, I, um, I can tell you anecdotally. <laughs> yeah, I just imagine a lot of students signing up for these are students that are excelling in most of their classes. Oddly, I think it crosses the spectrum pretty well. But I will say that our teachers will tell you that our, our younger students sometimes struggle with that stamina across the day. And so they've wanted us to be a little cautious about the number of ninth grade classes we offer for zero period and allowing ninth graders to take seven classes just because it can be overwhelming. But again, we're not here to be gatekeepers because there are plenty of ninth grade students who are very equipped to do that. Um, but in general, that's why I think you don't see that same demand for ninth grade courses. Okay. And you would say anecdotally, it seems like there's there's an effect or no effect? You know, I, I do think that what happens a lot um, is that kids who take zero period would sometimes end up with PE if they're not taking PE late in the day. Yeah. And I think that's beneficial. I certainly think we, you know, we have a, a number of our athletic PEs late in the day or last period of the day. That allows our athletes, in my mind, to take a zero period class and not have an AP class six period, you know, eight hours later. And so... I think our kids are pretty smart about crafting their schedule when they work with their counselor to make sure that they don't have that heavy lift at the end of the day if they have a zero. Yeah, yeah it makes sense. I, I guess I do have one more question, which would sure. be, that, I mean, I love all the different options here between the zero period and then on that next slide, the, the different um, you know, dual enrollment, the other uh, online options. Yeah. Are, do we have students that are earning enough credits it's credits to graduate a semester early? Mm -hmm. we, have we noticed the an uptick in that since offering this, all these options? Um, I would say it's probably, a, I don't have the statistics in front of me today, but um, I think we probably have more students graduating mid-semester of their senior year than previously. And we do have students who are taking classes sometimes in the summer at those other online um, opportunities, right? Again, UC Scout, Silicon Valley, both are really popular um, right now. And I think those are, those are great. Again, they're accredited, right? They're A through G. They're actually NCAA options. So even some of our student athletes have that option. And I, I, I will say as well, I think that graduation mid-year is um, more an athlete thing at this point in time, right? So they can engage in their sport if they're recruited as such or even if not at the community college early. Um, but we, I, I find that we've been able to work their schedule to make that work, right? We even had a student who shifted last year who was recruited heavily, is now at the University of Washington, right? Where he was able to graduate after his offer in his junior year, we were able to help him graduate at the end of his junior year. He didn't come back for his senior year. So we've been able to meet the needs of students and find flexibility in m almost all cases. Yeah. yeah. Which is not to say, I don't want to imply that there isn't a student or students, I have to recognize that out there, who says, I wish I could have taken these other three classes. I know that's happening. Um, but I think it happens to some extent at all schedules, right? right. Yeah. Good. And, and Howard, I think that kind of goes back to back when Joe actually graduated Nagata early, and so he can go to Clemson. So I know it worked for our student athletes. I mean, I hear nothing but good things about that. It's like, yeah, I'm, gra I'm graduating early. I'm going to, like Rico, Notre Dame. You know what I mean? It's like, 
they take advantage of that. So, yeah, and we've yeah. been able to last minute pivot, and some of these kids have really gotten a lot done in little time at all to meet the requirements, to provide themselves the opportunity. And some of these things, the credit recovery and some of our APEX engagement, summer school and otherwise over the last few years and making sure we have a credentialed teacher who is in the, that class administering the APEX and working with the student to make sure it's NCAA, right? Because that's critical. They have to be credentialed appropriately for it to be NCAA and it has to be the full course. Kids are getting it done. They're getting it done, but they realize it benefits them tremendously. So again, I, I, we're finding a lot of flexibility and we are trying to make sure we react appropriately and stay flexible for kids as we look at these solutions for them. Um, and I think it's gotten so much better than it was in 2018. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is great. Uh, Mystery, thanks for bringing this for us. Uh, thanks for the presentation and for sticking around late. Before we let you go, I must, I got no public comments in person. Are there any online? Okay, have a great night. Thank, Thank you. you. You too. Thank you. All right, that brings us to discussion item C, Vista Del Lago student concerns. Yes, and this item is a follow-up, um, again, from our student board members from previous <coughs> meetings. And Dr. Huber is going to give an overview of the three topics, the lunchtime noise levels at Vista Del Lago, the Columbus Day references on the calendar, and the menstrual products um, that our students brought forward with concerns a couple meetings ago. So Dr. Huber. Yeah, so this is just, uh, again, um, after working with um, Dr. Moore <clears throat> and Matt, we just wanted to, to update in terms of where things were at with uh, the concerns the students had brought forward. Do we have the, the, there we go. Next slide, please. Perfect. So um, Dr. Moore is working with um, Mr. Martini, who is actually uh, in charge of the lunchtime um, performances and, and the lunchtime performances, I guess, have, have been a long, long standing uh, tradition at Vista Del Lago High School. And so they, they definitely want to make sure that they maintain that as it's definitely part of the school culture, but they are working to ensure that the, the noise level, if you will, or the, the amount of decibels they're putting out during those per, uh, performances are at a more reasonable level. And so they're taking um, feedback from students and just kind of, you know, kind of checking the temperature of the campus in terms of those performances to make sure that they're in, 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 in an acceptable range. When it comes to the Columbus Day reference, um, number one, the, in the student handbook, there was a, a template to, I'm supposed to get closer to the microphone, okay. Um, there was a reference that was actually in the planner template. So that's the, the planner that came from the company and it simply wasn't caught that in the calendar, the company had included the reference to Columbus Day. So that is actually something that, that they'll be watching for from now on to ensure that doesn't happen and that if it is there, it's caught before the publication of the planner. And then the student announcement, it would appear that the, the students had gotten hold of um, kind of a previous document that had been used as they were kind of looking historically of what was announced on, on that day. And so the announcement was made highlighting Columbus Day, but it was a mistake. Um, Dr. Moore, again, uh, her and the team kind of looked into it. And they do not believe it was intentional. And obviously that won't happen again, but also they've now gone back and looked at the protocol that VISTA um, follows for all student announcements. And so there's a process now of all the student announcements being approved by um, the team at VISTA Del Lago before students read the announcements. So that shouldn't happen again. And then finally, in terms of the, the menstrual product concerns, um, I really liked this one approach in terms of there's a QR code poster now in all the bathrooms. And so the students can literally snap that QR code and alert the team at Vista Del Lago immediately if there's either shortage of product or if there's vandalism, et cetera, in the bathrooms. So they'll, um, the, the, the staff there gets um, on those concerns much more quickly. Also, uh, as a way of expanding, some of the teachers are now also um, having uh, bags of product in their classroom, kind of usually in an area near their door where students can discreetly just pick a bag up and, and as they either enter the class or exit the class if they need um, uh, menstrual um, care products. And then also we're working with Mr. Wa um, uh, Washburn to look at a review of the products that we do provide to see if there are other products that would be of a higher quality. We hadn't had this concern before from any of the other schools, but the fact that the VISTA students did bring it up we're going to um, work with the students. Uh, Ms. Moore, uh, Dr. Moore, again, is, is going to talk to the VISTA students because they had mentioned they had done some research about some other products that they thought were of higher quality. So we are going to connect back to VISTA in terms of what they had brought forward. And then um, 
maintenance is going to look in that as well to see if there are products out there that perhaps are higher quality, but that would be roughly the same price point for what the district pays for those products now. So that's basically the update in terms of what was brought forward previously. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the I board? have some comments, yeah, um, Mr. President. Uh, Dr. Huber, two comments. Uh, one f uh, regarding the menstrual product concerns. Um, I noticed that it says some teachers, their reason it's, it's not all teachers um, in regard to them offering it in their classrooms? Yeah, I'm not positive, but my understanding was this was kind of um, something that was just kind of done on a voluntary basis by some of the teachers. Some of the teachers just started doing this of their own accord. I don't believe it was something that was asked of the teachers. It was just kind of a natural kind of a result of the conversation that started happening at Vista. And so um, it's my understanding that's, that's how it is. That's why there's only a few teachers or I, I could come back with a number of how many are doing it, but I don't believe it's campus wide either. Yeah, and then um, secondly, regarding the lunchtime noise levels, um, I was actually in that class uh, last term that did the performances master guitar. I think the reason, it, because in previous years, there wasn't a concern like this, obviously, and it wasn't brought up until this year. And I think personally, um, the reason that the, um, the noise level has been brought to our attention this year is I, I think it has something to do with the genre of the music that they're playing during lunchtime. This year, I've noticed there's, uh, this year, myself and my classmates, we noticed a lot more rock and metal songs being played at lunchtime. I'm not sure if you guys have been over to Vista during lunchtime compared to previous years. It was more mellow music, so I don't know if you guys have considered that, but I just wanted to put that out there. Maybe it's the genre of the music. Yeah, no, I think actually that is one of the things that they're they're thinking about. Um, so definitely the, the type of music that's being performed might come across in terms of kind of maybe perhaps more aggressive um, than other types of music. So it is one of the things that I believe Dr. Moore is working with Mr. Martini on because it might need to make adjustments depending on the genre of music being played at the time. Thank you. Other questions or comments? We well, appreciate you following up on all these uh, and yeah, we definitely appreciate you keeping us updated as we are making changes to any of these, but thank you, Dr. Huber. Huber. Okay, that brings us to discussion item E. Oh, before I do that, I should see if there's any online comments. Okay, I don't see any public comment up here. Uh, brings us to the discussion item E. First read board policy 5113.2 work permits. Dr. Kaligi? Yeah, the changes that are coming to us uh, in this particular board policy are recommended through CSBA. They are not major changes. Uh, we did review them with our uh, board policy subcommittee on December 4th. Uh, but Dr. Huber and his team reviewed this and can answer any questions the board may have. Any questions from the board? Not seeing any uh, public comments online? Not seeing any? Okay. Uh, so this one will come back to us at the following board meeting. Uh, that brings us to discussion item F, first read board policy 6111 school calendar. And this, this policy is coming back to the board after we the board decided on the, the key school calendar for next year with the um, request to look at some ways of standardizing our instructional calendars going forward um, with determining um, certain times in the year uh, when uh, the longer breaks happen and giving staff and families the ability to, to plan those um, vacation times um, in advance. So I'm gonna turn this over to Mr. Ogden to review um, some of the criteria that this uh, revised calendar has included. So what we did was we tried to memorialize some of the traditional things that we do in Folsom Cordova. And typically when, we, when staff brings forward a calendar, we talk about, well, this is when we start, this is when we have our, our Christmas break, uh, this is when we do our spring break, this is when we uh, end the school year. And so what we did here is really sort of capture some language and that's in the green here uh, on these different um, start times, breaks, and uh, trying to get the calendar done um, before June. Um, also, this does reference a, uh, an AR, and, um, and in that AR it talks about holidays. And so now in California, um, Juneteenth is a National Independence Day holiday. It's, a, it's a June 19th, and so that's a, um, it's a non, the schools are not allowed to be open that day, and if employees work that day, it's a, it's working a holiday. Good. Any questions from the board? 
Uh, yes, Mr. Yeah. President. Yeah, Mr. Clerk. So, Don, um, are we still, I'm, I'm looking at this about uh, Easter, are we still attaching it to the Easter holiday or can we detach it in any way? Is well, the days that we have attached right now are uh, the Friday before and the Monday after Easter as non-instructional days. The, the five-day week would be uh, different, so that would be detached, but we do have yep. the Friday before and the Monday after. Yeah, I, I would say that's the, there are a couple of major changes in this, which yeah. I, I think the board needs to be aware of. Um, one of the major changes is we are detaching the spring break from Easter. Uh, spring break uh, will now uh, follow, uh, be um, the first week of April with five school days. So if you look at the calendar, uh, the first week of April where all five, Monday through Friday, is in the month of April, that is spring break. Now, sometimes it will coincidentally be tied to Easter, and sometimes it won't. Um, what, uh, but it, it, one of the things it does, and, and actually chatting with the union as well, is it, it guarantees that our spring break is just a little bit later than it, it sometimes falls. Because sometimes where Easter falls, spring break is very early. And, it, and when it falls early, there's a long period of time uh, between when spring break ends and the end of the school year with basically no vacation. And, you know, you know, students start to burn out. And, you know, being able to have a more consistent um, spring break that is just, you know, consistently a little bit closer to the end of the school year is hopefully going to be good for the students, good for the teachers, um, uh, good for the parents for being able to predict it as well. Um, so I, I, I think that's a huge change here that, that we see here. But we also recognize that people do travel over Easter, perhaps a lot of people. So it, it still continues to give the Friday before Easter and the Monday after Easter off. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I uh, will take it out of public comment. I see none in person, none online. Um, so we'll, again, this one will come back for us. Um, but thank you for, Mr. Reefer, for explaining that, pointing that out. Uh, that is important for us to know. Uh, we are coming up against 1030. We are nearly done uh, with our agenda, but if uh, if there would be a motion to extend the meeting past 1030. I'll move to extend the meeting past 1030, no later than 1045. Hopefully we can get out of here by that time. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Uh, motion by Mr. Clark. I'll second it. Second by Mr. Reed. Superintendent. Mr. Mellager. Aye. Mr. Merrill. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Ms. Larratt. Aye. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Hooley. Aye. All right, great. Well, that takes us to item 12, superintendent report. Superintendent. I'll talk really fast, too. <laughs> On the consent agenda tonight, the board approved all of our school accountability report cards. I just wanted to acknowledge that and thank our school sites for putting those together. Um, I also want to acknowledge the Native American Parent Advisory Committee that came forward tonight and talked about Native American education. And if there is a point of contact in that group that's listening or will watch this later to contact uh, my assistant, Michelle Dagnell, so we can find out more. There is. I can get that to you. Okay. And then I also want to acknowledge and thank our community and residents um, from the Rancho Cordova who, area who recently participated and gave helpful feedback on the district um, educational priorities survey uh, for looking at the possibility um, of a future bond uh, to support our schools in Rancho Cordova. Uh, the results are, are very encouraging and those results will be posted on our website. So I wanna encourage public to, to take a look at that as well. And we have so much to be proud of and thankful for, um, but big shout out for our community schools team and working in conjunction with our attendance <coughs> and due process and our site leadership, all to the benefit of our students to getting them to school every day, getting them engaged, working with families, working with staff, and it, it just um, bringing all those pieces together. Um, but also a huge shout out for our att attendance and due process team. Uh, they are in the midst of their second 20 day challenge. I wanna thank our student board members and student advisory board for their um, amplifying student voice and your voice really impacts you know, students and them listening to you. So I wanna thank you for your efforts 
and we look forward to continuing to see those increases with everybody's you know focus going in the same direction so thank you thank you uh brings us to item 14 board member reports start with the student board members mr <coughs> Merrill. hello everyone um i just want to start off by congratulating all the student athletes who came up today um, I know it's real hard playing a sport as a student athlete myself. I can make the argument that it's harder than getting all A's in your classes. So I sh I'm looking forward to the spring sports um, presentation at the end of the year. And yeah, I just want to congratulate everyone who came out. Um, I also want to talk about the Native American Education um, Title VI program that was talked about during the public comment today. Um, as a district who boasts about you know culture and diversity, I was actually kind of surprised that we don't have a specialized program for our native students. Um, although my I am not a native person, I have plenty of peers who are Native American, and I can definitely see them benefiting from the mm. program that they are proposing to us. We can't rewrite history, but we can start writing tomorrow's history today. I would love to reach out to the other districts uh, who have these programs and see how they structure theirs and reach out to the Native American Parent Advisory Committee on how to structure our own. Um, and I think of all the places that we can spend our Title VI dollars, um, this is a good place to spend them. Yeah, That's it, thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Melador. Thank you, Mr. President. Tonight has definitely been about our students. I wanna congratulate the athletes who were recognized early today for the outstanding efforts in the fall sports season. And I also wanna highlight the Montessori program as well as the community schools, uh, individuals who came out represented, gave us great speeches and presentations, highlighting how this district can positively engage our diverse <coughs> student body through unconventional learning approaches. Uh, I wanna take uh, us back to last year when our district approved the ethnic studies curriculum for the 23-24 school year. A lot of the students expressed similar educational injustices to the testimonies that we heard from Native American groups today. And students, again, were at the forefront of this movement and they highlighted a disconnect between their education and then their personal heritage and their personal experiences. Former student board members, uh, Rosie Perez and Ria Srivastava, they highlighted that their um, that curriculum greatly increased their connection to, the, to their um, education. And as a Filipino American student, I have seen the difference that it does make seeing your name in a text or seeing your heritage in a textbook and seeing your background recognized in a curriculum and in classroom discussions. It really makes a difference. So we did it once with ethnic studies, and I think we can do it again by implementing a Native American education Title VI program. It's a necessity, if not an urgency, of this district to implement. And the students who came out here today to speak on behalf of implementing or recognizing <clears throat> Indigenous Peoples Day, they um, have supplemented the need that this district needs to recognize student needs and student concerns first. And so with student input and community input, I feel that we can make a, this program possible in our district and rewrite history today. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lerick. The news guys I already talked really fast, so we can zip <laughs> right through this. Um, yeah, I wanted to thank, first of all, all Everyone who always comes out for public comment, um, it really does like shape how what our thoughts are and how much we appreciate that. Um, anybody who comes online or submits their public comment, we, I always appreciate uh, perspectives from the community, and and so I just want to tell everyone how much I appreciate that. Um, I did want to see if everyone would be willing to adjourn tonight's meeting in memory of Margie Moon, um, longtime educator within our district. Um, I know for me personally, she was a huge impact on my life and she will be greatly missed. And, um, you know, I know that she was just such a vital part of like the community and wanted to extend our condolences to her family at this difficult time. She was, she was amazing. So um, just wanted to, you know, highlight um, the contributions that she's made to so many students' education within our district. Um, and then just wanted to Thank everyone again um, for coming out to the ribbon cutting last week at the Cordova High Weight Room. Long-term goal of mine, so I super appreciate staff's time and the City of Rancho Cordova's partnership with that. I wanted to thank Mr. Huey for allowing me to speak, knowing how passionate I was about it. Um, and wanted to th uh, thank all of our student athletes for being out here and their parents tonight. And um, did appreciate the community coming out about um, the Native American group. So um, I'd be interested definitely in hearing more about that, that programming. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reed. Uh, no board report tonight. Mr. Clark. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> 
Um, just wanted to start off um, and say that we are going to, my wife Jean and I are offering the Clark Memorial Family Scholarship again. Um, her and I had a deep conversation about it. Uh, we still will recognize those winners with $500 um, each from Cordova, Vista, and Folsom. But we decided to do something a little extra this time around, so we will recognize each student, another student from Vista, Cordova, and Folsom with a second place award of $300. Um, just a little something extra for that. So hopefully if these counselors are listening, um, we'll send the information over and the criteria for them to uh, apply for that scholarship. Uh, my thanks to NAPAC. Uh, I actually got a couple of messages from them. They were very appreciative of coming in and talking about um, Title VI. I do know that one of the four uh, themes that will be taught in ethnic studies, I think next year, will be Native American studies in the high school, but we still need to focus on the middle school and elementary school. Um, I heard a couple of them mention Sutter Middle School, so I'm going to bring it up again because I asked about three months ago if it was possible to form a committee to take a look at the possible name change. So just for the record, I am bringing it up again. Um, that the, hopefully the board, I can get a consensus from the board to at least explore it. Um, you know, I, I think it would be great. They gave some very valid reasons as to why, and I know that there is a, a school in Sac City that has changed uh, their Sutter Middle School. I think it was to Miwok, I can't remember. Um, but maybe we need to really seriously look at that and consider. Um, and then, I don't know if this is possible, uh, recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day, but maybe have a board resolution. Um, I don't know if we need board consensus, if it's something that we can direct the superintendent to do, but I think that would be nice to uh, actually have that uh, as a reso and, and maybe invite NAPAC out and just tell them, hey, you know, we're doing this um, and it needs to be done. So anyway, um, that is it. That is all for me. Um, look forward to the Parent Summit uh, in a couple of weeks, and that's it. Thank you. A uh, quick report for me. I, I would just say uh, I, I actually, of course, this was going to happen, but we changed our, our committees that the board is on, and uh, I showed up at the wrong one last week. Uh, luckily, I, I there wasn't, uh, we didn't have three board members there, so I stuck around the Special Education Committee, and uh, just want to recognize Betty Jo. Um, I know we're going to have some more information about this coming out, so I won't uh, uh, get too much into the changes that are potentially upcoming, but um, you're doing some amazing work and, and have some really great plans. Uh, so I just appreciate the forward thinking and uh, what you're doing for our students and how you led that committee. So uh, that's it for my report. Uh, that brings us to item 15, advanced planning. Our next board meeting, uh, our next board meeting will be a special board study session right here uh, on Saturday morning. Uh, so, and that will, I just want to remind the public, that will be in person only. Uh, we'll also have a, a special joint board study session on Monday, January 29th, and then our next regularly scheduled board meeting uh, just a couple of days later on February 1st. Uh, so it'll be a busy couple of weeks. Um, but that brings us to item B, 12-month board calendar. 12-month board calendar is on the agenda for you to look at. I did want to point out one thing and uh, just throw it out to the board. Um, I was looking through this calendar and realized that on June 15th, we have a special board study session. That's typical for us. The agenda for that study session is a superintendent's performance review. That's one item. Uh, that'll be about two weeks before our, our superintendent retires, <laughs> as well as a um, what we're planning on uh, actually coming up, so doing another board self-evaluation. Uh, so I, I wanted to throw it out to the board to see if we might consider canceling that meeting uh, and then working with the new superintendent to maybe plan something in July or early August where we could have a special study session with the new superintendent. Uh, I think it might not necessarily be worthwhile to uh, do a performance review, um, 
right, right before uh, Dr. Kalikian retires. <laughs> uh, so as long as everybody's okay with that, I would uh, maybe have that come back to us at our next board meeting under a consent agenda um, that we reschedule that meeting. I think that's a brilliant idea. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, before yeah, you close sorry. out, um, the special joint board meeting on the 29th, uh, just for the record, I may be a few minutes late. My flight does come in at 5.30 at that time. Uh, if I can catch an earlier flight back, um, I should be there by 6, but no later than 6.30, 7 o'clock. Okay. Thank you for letting us know. We'll hope that that flight comes in uh, on time. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, that brings us then to advanced planning item C, suggested future agenda items. Um, does anybody have any suggested future agenda items? Mr. Reed. Yeah, if, if, uh, if there's a consensus or a majority of the board, um, I, I would like to understand and learn more about uh, what a Native American education program is. I, 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 you know, unfortunately, because it wasn't scheduled, I couldn't ask them any questions. But one of the questions I was going to ask is, what is, is this an elective? Is this um, a required class? Is this something that we incorporate into um, existing curriculum, such as the ethnic studies class? I, I just didn't understand what, what it was they're referring to. Um, and I think having that on the agenda so we could at least have, um, maybe it's an information item, so we can at least have a, a discussion to, to better understand what, what that is. Um, I, I, I think that could be helpful. Well, Title VI is a federally funded uh, program uh, specifically for Native American studies in the schools. And I think what NAPAC was saying is that we don't have that, but we can get the funding. I know that they have a form, 406, I can't remember what it is, that they fill out to show their eligibility as Native Americans. And I think they submit that either to the district or the state. I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm pretty sure I can reach out to them to see if they're willing to do a presentation and what that all entails as far as um, their, our Native American kids getting the proper education on Native American studies uh, or what that may look like. So if you, if I can reach out to them and maybe have them reach out to yeah. Rochelle or the superintendent. If you have a, that contact name yes, too, that would be helpful mm -hmm. and I can follow up too. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'd be open to hearing more about it. And, yeah, it's um, just hard to reflect on it if, when you don't know exactly what, 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 what they're referring to. Yeah. It looks like the rest of the board is open to that. Great. Uh, <laughs> any other suggested future agenda items? I do have one. Um, uh, and I, I know we had our, our athletic teams here today. One of the things I've been thinking about lately is um, you know, trying to get a gauge of the impact of our athletic teams on our campuses, um, both, you know, for good and potentially, you know, things that we need to watch out for and barriers that we're coming up against. Uh, so one of the things I would like to suggest, see what the board thinks about it is, um, you know, we, we do have a tracking, uh, a way to track our injuries with our sports teams. Uh, although I would say that this year's tracking system shows zero injuries for Cordova High Football and Folsom High Football. Wow. So I think it might need some reworking. Um, I would like to see us begin to track that. I think right now we just don't have a real clear sense of, you know, what the impact of injuries on any of our sports teams. Um, and I would say including injuries where students have to miss school, have to see a doctor, or have a traumatic brain injury or concussion. Uh, so I, I would, between now and the end of this school year, to give our sports teams plenty of time at next school year, I would love to see us develop some system uh, where it's not reported by coaches, which I think is how it's currently done, um, but we come up with a different way. Um, so we can actually have make informed decisions about what we're doing with our sports. It may be that there, we don't want to do anything, but we're talking about putting a new high school um, in our district, building a new high school, I would love to be able to look at data and say what sports do we want in that high school based on what we're seeing um, from our programs right now um, and be able to make informed choices about our current programs. So if the board's open to that, I would love the district staff to come back to us with an idea about how can we do a better job of tracking that and what kind of data can we look at. So, but for me, it's, it's mostly what are the injuries that are uh, traumatic brain injuries, um, injuries that require doctor visits and how many days of school are lost due to any of those injuries. So uh, 
wonder if, if people are open at least to that discussion. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. I mean, I think that's a good idea to, you know, because I know there, there's there been some injuries, trust of course, me. Yeah. I, I've witnessed yeah. a couple of them. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that would be a good idea. I don't mean to call it the football programs. Those are just the most obvious ones. There's other programs that you sure. know, we're, we're just not doing a great job tracking. Well, and I think I think beyond that too is beyond the injury is are there things that we could do that are preventative that we're not taking those steps to prevent the injury, you know, whether that's from an equipment standpoint or different things like that that we could maybe invest into. Good. Uh, so I know there's a a lot on our plate. Uh, so I don't know that that needs to come back in the next month or so. But I would love to see that by maybe a board meeting in April so that we have a little bit of time to talk about it before the school year ends, Mr. Clark. Yeah, I, I did have one final comment, and I I do apologize, Mr. President. Okay. Um, the, one of the tribal leaders from NAPAC mentioned something about, and I wrote it down because it was like, what is that a land acknowledgement? When he came in, he was talking about the different lands that were occupied here um, in this district. And it dawned on me, because I had heard it before at a uh, conference that some schools, and I think there's a couple of local schools like uh, Twin Rivers, Natomas, Woodland Joint, and I think San Juan that does a land acknowledgement for the Native Americans. Uh, Superintendent, have you heard anything about that? I've done just some preliminary research. Most has been at um, college level or in city jurisdictions like city council, but I think one in Sacramento County, I think Elk Grove has just adopted something. I haven't seen it, so I'm we've asked to get a copy so we could take a look yeah, at I'm that. Yeah, I'm just kind of curious of what that actually means or entails or, I mean, I've heard about it, but that's it. So maybe that's something with the board's consensus that we can look at. I mean, I'm when he mentioned it, it's like, hmm, okay, that sounds familiar. I wonder if that, at least the first step, if maybe that could come back to us as an informational yeah, absolutely. item. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd be happy with that. I just had, I had actually one more agenda item was, um, I think at some point we had talked about DT coming back uh, about an update, updating us on safety issues and things like that. And I don't think we've seen that yet for this year. So I don't know if we had a plan for that to come to us at all soon or. Was that on all the safety issues or the fencing project according no, to No, I think all the safety issues. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cause I think, I think at where we kind of ended last year was that DT would kind of come back to us with some matrixes um, of kind of where we're at with safety. I know we've had our committee, but I don't know that the board's really been filled in on kind of beyond the fencing issues, kind of what we've had going with the with safety. And you know, have we seen things increase, decrease? You know, what are what are we kind of looking at? You know, I think especially as we're talking about bonds going forward and some of the questions that were asked to the, the public about safety and things like that as we kind of start to form that of maybe where we're talking, you know, some of those issues lay. Yeah, I'd love to see that come back as well. Uh, Mr. President, I actually, I, I do have another uh, re maybe request to see if we have a majority of the board. Um, <laughs> but, but um, <laughs> you know, we have a board policy that prohibits uh, engagement in political um, uh, positions, uh, whether it's in our classrooms or within our district. Um, and there's been a number of occasions where <laughs> that line has been crossed both in the classroom as well as perhaps in the district. I, you know, I would love to see that come back, that policy come before this, this board for a discussion on that. Um, whether it's um, you know, political issues on the right or the political issues on the left, um, you know, I think at the very least, we need to re-educate our uh, district that we have a board policy on um, not bringing up political uh, discussions. Uh, um, in the classroom or, or anywhere else. Um, so I'd be happy to see that come to us. Yeah. Are you referring to the controversial issues, board policy, where that lives right now? Yeah, I think there's a, there might be one or m more references to, to that. Um, I think there's an instructional uh, policy uh, specifically related to teachers. I think there's a, a other, uh, I think there's, it's cross-referenced in a couple of places. Good. All right, that's good. That uh, brings us back to, uh, we don't need to go back into closed session. We did finish our business, so it brings us to item 20, adjournment. Uh, if there's no objection, we will adjourn in honor of Margie Moon. Okay.
Hearing no objection, we're adjourned.